vertical breathing specifically, when you see a lot of uh, guys who are maybe they're pretty uptight, they're <laughs> they're they're up here, mm -hmm. right? How can that not reflect itself in the bedroom? You're using your neck and shoulder muscles to pick up your rib cage to breathe. Mm -hmm. And the way we should be breathing is horizontally, which means you're breathing diaphragmatically. So the middle of your body is expanding and then it's narrowing. What happens when someone's really panicked? What do you see happening with someone's breathing uh, in those cases? What happens when you are anxious is that your breath becomes uh, faster and more shallow. Now here's the problem, if you already breathe that way naturally, oh. you're more apt to get anxious. And breath holding has become actually quite a serious problem and it happens because our screens are small. Yeah, so if you look out into the horizon, you will take a wider, bigger breath and you will do it naturally. Let's go, bro. With that type of breathing, what's going on? You're upregulating. So you're waking yourself up. Your obliques are either so tight um, that you can't take a breath, so that's the muscular corset, or you're so stressed and you're, you're prepared, right? When you're gonna go into a meeting or go into a competition or something, you automatically get into this stance where you're braced. So that's normal, okay? Um, however, if your day continues that way, so you're constantly braced, is that that's not good. If you're leaking when you lift, is that it's a very slippery slope. Women deadlifting 500, 600 pounds, that's some crazy weight. Is yeah. Are you saying like at that point, there's really minimal way to improve it unless there's a bit of a back off period dealing with the pelvic floor, then going back to that weight? Yes, T-spine, top of the body, you need to be able to turn around without your ribs turning as well, right? And again, if you can't do that, you're prey. She you went to the school that beat my school when I was a senior in the playoffs. Oh, shit. Really? <laughs> she went to, yeah, North Rockland High so, School. Yeah. So they, your school paid refs is what <laughs> she's saying. <laughs> no, we had, uh, our defensive back was yeah. so slow, and I was always so pissed that he was back there. <sighs> and I knew he was right. going to and blow it at one point and he did he got smoked <laughs> and we lost seven to nothing you still uh, remember the details Santos. I punched him right bitter. in the face <laughs> isn't it funny how we remember the names like, I can't remember my pin I or my password I tell the coach anything. all the time like I'm so much faster than he is why is he back there he's horrible he's gonna get smoked oh, yeah man. Pat Project family we talk about sleep all the time on this podcast, as you know. That's why we've partnered with Eight Sleep Mattresses. And the amazing thing about Eight Sleep Mattresses, and one of the reasons why they are nicknamed the Tesla of beds, is because of the technology behind the Pod Pro cover. Not only does it literally change its temperature through the night, first off, it can go from 55 degrees all the way to 110, but the temperature changes through the night based off your own body temperature. It also tracks your heart rate, your heart rate variability, you're tossing and turning, your partner's tossing and turning. And based off of that, in consecutive nights, it will literally change the temperature settings so that you get better quality sleep on different nights. It's it, it blows my mind at how great these mattresses are. So, Andrew, tell them how to get it, please. Yeah, absolutely. So the other cool thing, too, is like the app will actually, you know, you track everything through the app, but then it'll send you messages like, hey, do you feel more rested today? Well, that's no surprise because, you know, it gives you all the information. And yeah, it's just really cool, like to be able to track that sort of thing. So that way, you know, like, you know, you can't get better at something you're not tracking and it does it for you. So head over to 8sleep.com slash power project. That's eight spelled out. So E-I-G-H-T sleep.com slash power project and you will automatically receive $150 off of the pod pro cover or the pod pro cover and mattress combo uh, again no code for that you guys will get that automatically links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes i've already met like admitted a lot of stuff on this podcast i'm not a closet <laughs> freak anymore <laughs> he's just a freak there's there no go. closet anymore no more right? no. you guys blew that fucker way down <laughs> Do we have yeah. rules about cursing nope. or no? No, no. Oh, you're allowed to do everything. A lot of it. Everything goes. <laughs> Are we already starting? I think so. Yeah. 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 Good. We should. So yeah. I, I when I worked for Fox for a while, um, and again, you know, as a sex and health editor at Men's Fitness, mm -hmm. and then I got hired by Fox to also do their sexual health and relationship content. Sex editor. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Awesome. Sex editor. Like, That's do you awesome. make it? More inappropriate or less inappropriate? <laughs> more. Always more. <laughs> yeah, right. Make it more spicy so people want to read it, right? <laughs> well, yes and no. So so Fox calls me in and they say we want a sex editor because everybody wanted sort of a, 
a Sex in the City kind of person answering questions. This is questions. before the whole Me Too stuff, right? This is definitely before <laughs> that, yeah. So they say, but we, so we want you to write things that are like titillating. We want <laughs> that word. We want. I know just the word. It's yeah, got, real it's word. got tit in it, it right? Yeah, titillating, right? <laughs> we want a salacious. I mean, there was all these words that were just. You know, sounded like they were pervy, pervy, totally pervy words. And they said, but we don't, we can't use any um, body language, mm. you know, anatomy. So can't I said, say like vagina or penis or anything. Can't like say vagina, can't say penis. I said, wait a second. <laughs> so I'm supposed to be talking about intercourse, right? Uh, and they said, yes, but don't use penis or vagina. <laughs> and I said, so you want stick and berries and, and the JJ? <laughs> And they said yes. So every, I have never known so many euphemisms and <laughs> silly words for body parts. That's great. Yeah. I need yeah. to go read some of these articles and see kind of like how they were just phrased. Right. That's just oh. the lesson in and of itself. Well, my honey pot, I think, was the best one for vagina. <laughs> my honey yeah. pot was Susan good. used that one, too. Right. Yeah, I think so. The honey yeah. pot. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. That's honey potting. That's honey dicking. That's where uh, it came ooh. from. This yeah. is true. Yeah. Wow. Hey, only if they could all be honey pots. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know what I mean? We're not lucky enough. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I got fired from that job very uh, quickly. Uh, you did? Yes, I did. Oh, okay. I did, yeah. Well, uh, you know, and I also got a lot of how'd hate you, mail. How did you get into writing? So everybody in my family writes. I come mm. from a, a family of, of writers and, and college professors. I'm the only one wow. who is not a college professor. So um, even my brother, he is an archaeologist. He's a Machu Picchu expert, and he rolls, yeah. of course. Um, so I started writing. Uh, you know, it was – the first magazine was called – I don't remember, but it was a dream analysis column. So mm -hmm. they wanted me to do a dream analysis column, which was great. I mean, I do as a psychologist, I talk to people about dreams. So folks would write in their dreams and I would analyze them. Usually it was celebs um, and analyze the dreams. And then Men's Fitness, again, wanted a sex and health person. Actually, they wanted a sex writer. So I went in, I applied for the job because I thought, you know, why not? <laughs> right. And, um, they offered it to me, and I thought about it, and I thought, you know, I don't have a degree in uh, sexual health, you know, um, or, or, you know, sexuality and human behavior and that sort. And my own personal life is really not that interesting that I have a good reference point to be a sex editor. And so I went back and I said, you know, I don't really think I'm qualified. Is there anything else? And my friend said, Belize, of course you can talk about sex. I mean, you do all the time anyway. Don't worry that you don't have the degree. So I took the job and I said, you have to say sex and health, though, because I want to be able to talk about mental health and, and health in general. But uh, it was a blast. It was a blast being at Men's Fitness and, and being able to talk about, you know, all kinds of stuff. So, so get the got, girl. Huh? You got hate mail? I, at Fox, hate I got hate mail. About sex? Yeah, yeah, I definitely got hate mail. So because you have all kinds of people listening, and you have people thinking that you know you shouldn't have sex before marriage, and I, um, I respect that. Yeah. If that's if that's what you want to do, that's cool. Um, but you sh I should be able to write about it. And if I wrote about, I know I did a column on on Plan B, and Ooh. people got you know that was kind of kind of hard too. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, yeah, the, everybody had an opinion, and they wanted to write in and tell me, you know, what a liberal slut I was. <laughs> and I said, I'm neither. I'm neither liberal nor slut, so you're wrong. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, it was, a, it was a good time. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> do you still utilize uh, some of your, your writing skills, like, nowadays? Do you find that some of that experience has come in really handy with what you're doing now? The, the sexual part or the writing part? Just the writing part. Yeah, yeah. Um, the writing part. <laughs> well, I guess the sexual part. I mean, we can get to that later. But breathing, I mean. It all falls in line. Yeah, like, it, yeah, it all does. works together. So. Yeah, but, but the breathing and tantra. Yeah. And I got to tell you, so the last book I wrote is called Breathing for Warriors. Mm -hmm. And um, the publishers wanted there to be a chapter on sex. So in the initial proposal, there is a chapter on sex. And I didn't want it there. I really didn't want it there. Because I thought, you know, it felt cheap it felt like i was like throwing in some gratuitous mm. penis and vagina talk or you know twig and berries and honey pot talk just to sell a book and mm -hmm. i was like no i really want this to be about strength endurance precision and recovery and thankfully i got them to say to you know to take that chapter out but uh, and i'm happy to tell you what would have been in it as well when you talk about tantra and and breathing and having sex and breathing through your balls and all that, that's all yeah, yeah. <laughs> thats the breathing that goes together with mm -hmm. sex. I so. think, let, let, let's talk about that sure. for a bit. Because like, you know, when we, in your book, which your book is really good, but when you talk about like vertical breathing, mm -hmm. horizontal breathing, mm -hmm. but 
vertical breathing specifically, when you see a lot of uh, guys who are maybe they're pretty uptight, they're, they're, they're up here, mm -hmm. right? How can that not reflect itself in the bedroom? And then how can not be that not be detrimental over time, right? Mm -hmm. So like, like, let's talk about how that affects, I guess, men's performance mm -hmm. and even like all of that and how we can fix that if that's an issue. Sure. And I mean, that's, that's a great question because if you're breathing vertically, you're using your neck and shoulder muscles to pick up your rib cage to breathe. Mm -hmm. And the way we should be breathing is horizontally, which means you're breathing diaphragmatically. So the middle of your body is expanding and then it's narrowing. And also what's happening if you're breathing diaphragmatically is that your pelvic floor is involved in the breath. And it may be just a tiny amount, mm. but if you're breathing with your diaphragm right underneath your diaphragm and sort of flipped over is your pelvic floor. So you're going to be able to oxygenate. And again, think about um, all the uh, different products, I'm sure you don't know about them, that have to do with enlarging your penis or making it harder. We They're vasodilators. We <laughs> know a lot. No, we don't know anything. That's a joke. I'm like, what? Now we do. <laughs> we do. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Yeah, we've talked about this kind of stuff before, and there's been all kinds of people who are like, we don't need any help with that, and then they're like clicking on all these links. You know, that <laughs> that. Like, we have 50,000 clicks today, but yeah. everyone says it's like, I'm 25 years old. I don't have problems with that. I don't need any help. And they're like, click, click, click. click. <laughs> can't click fast enough, open up all these windows on their computer. <laughs> <laughs> and then they come in forever. Then they're like following you on all your social oh, media, yeah. right? I don't know how that got there. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> <laughs> so when you're breathing horizontally is that your pelvic floor is going to be more involved. Mm -hmm. And again, like you can, you can do this is that when you inhale and the middle of your body expands and your shoulders stay calm and, and soft is that your pelvic floor, your glutes and your bicycle seat that is your pelvic floor relaxes. Mm -hmm. Now on the exhale, you're going to squeeze. You can use your core to squeeze and you're also going to squeeze your pelvic floor just a little bit. And that's a whole body breath. So we're supposed to be breathing and our whole body is supposed to be pulsating and moving as we breathe. If you're breathing up and down with your shoulders, you're neglecting everything from your armpits down. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely, breathing diaphragmatically is going to help your pelvic floor and it's going to help everything that's around your pelvic floor. And yeah. we need that because right now our pelvic floors are just crushed. Let's uh, maybe talk about some of this in reverse for a moment. Like mm -hmm. um, what happens when someone's really panicked and mm -hmm. what happens when somebody, uh, you know, is maybe especially expressing to you from years ago uh, as a psychologist, maybe expressing that they have a lot of anxiety and they start maybe rehe they start maybe uh, rehashing a story to you mm -hmm. about why they feel they feel this way. What do you see happening with someone's breathing uh, in those cases? So you were talking about anxiety disorders and anxiety disorders are the most common mental health problem that we have. People think it's depression, it's actually anxiety. Mm -hmm. And anxiety disorders, it breaks up into obsessive compulsive disorder, um, panic attacks, generalized anxiety, um, PTSD. Uh, and phobias, there's five. So if you think about that there's five of those and think about the people that you have around you is that you are going to know someone, if not a few people that have one of those five types of anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. What happens when you are anxious is that your breath becomes uh, faster and more shallow. Now here's the problem. If you already breathe that way naturally, oh. okay, and you have something happen to you or you have a, a st stressful job or a stressful day is that you're more apt to get anxious. And now if you're in that vicious circle, getting out of it is really tough without, you know, a shot of tequila or a, a Xanax or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the way we can break that cycle is by changing the breath. Now, I'm not saying don't go to therapy or don't take your meds or this is going to take the place of that, but it will take you down a notch and you can get to the point where you can control it because the mind looks to the breath to see. It's, it's the connection. It is the mind-body connection. So you can be telling yourself, I'm okay, I'm okay, it's going to be all right, it's going to be all right, but your brain isn't listening to what you're <laughs> saying. It's listening to your breathing. Hmm. I'm curious about the anxiety aspect of things because also you're a psychologist, so you have way more insight on this than I do. But I know like a lot of my family's in Nigeria. 
Nigeria, it's it's very modernized, but still there's an aspect within the culture where like people are still using their bodies a lot more. Kids aren't nearly as sedentary. Kids still walking back and forth to school because there's a lack of infrastructure. And you see like the rates of anxiety disorders within the United States being so high. And some would say, oh, it's just not recorded in other countries. That's why it seems to be so low. But there seems to be lifestyle factors in other countries that even though they don't have as much, right, as much as we have here, they also do more with their body, which leads them to probably have more control over their breathing. And it seems that they, even though they have less, they also have less problems as far as anxiety disorders, et cetera. And when I talk to my relatives back there, they're not living nearly as good as some of us here but they're happy <laughs> or, 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 or they're living and, and they, they don't have those types of issues. But I also, when I talk to them, I also notice the way they're breathing. They're not, they're, they don't seem that way. So I, I'm, I'm curious how much of that, I know can't just be breath, but how much can be linked back to the way people are brought up, the way people breathe through stress, that, that type of stuff. Such a great question and such a great summary. That was like, that was beautiful. Um, is that so? The first thing you're talking about is countries that have um, diseases or problems that have to do with overconsumption, which is us, mm -hmm. right? And then um, diseases of poverty or situations that have to do with poverty. Yeah. So there's a big thick line that divides those two. So we have diseases of overconsumption. So we have um, obesity is obviously the the, the best example of that. Um, so what happens when you stop moving is that you don't discharge energy. So for instance, when, and this drives me crazy, is that when people tell kids to sit down, like sit down, be still, sit down, be still. And even the whole movement to bring meditation into schools is, is fantastic, yeah. but kids need to discharge energy before you calm down. Mm -hmm. So even us, you know, before we say, hey, I'm a little antsy, let me take a couple deep breaths. You gotta do 10 burpees. You gotta do something to discharge the energy. I always look at, at history and anthropology and, and the animal kingdom to see what happens. And we're the only organisms who go straight to the brain and try to figure it out and don't think about, well, what movement should I do? Or what do I need to uh, uh, help my brain understand this concept? So for instance, um, in, and, I'll, and I'll bring in an example from jiu-jitsu, is that uh, Hickson does his s -s -s, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And if you look at it, it's partially his thing, which is totally cool. Like everybody has their thing that they do. Yeah, what is that? Yeah, I guess you're going to explain, <laughs> yeah. but what is he doing yeah. when he does that? So he's actually doing, everything he teaches comes from yoga, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and he does it brilliantly. In, in a, he's, you know, a genetic freak when it comes to jiu-jitsu and, and, and sport. But um, tss, Exhale, that exhale is, is Kapalabhati. Um, I call it an exhale pulsation, but you're squeezing your body and you're getting air out of your body. Um, so in yoga, you are dispersing irritability when you do that. That's, that's the yoga philosophy behind it. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna look at the muscular part of it, the anatomical part, is that you're exhaling completely. So you're focusing on the exhale. The exhale is the underdog. So in general, we exhale very, very poorly. Mm -hmm. And there actually is um, a study that Eric Pepper did um, that looked at people who do not exhale well tend to be more anxious. And I'll give you the reference to that article as well. Mm -hmm. So what he's doing is make sense anatomically. He's making sure he exhales completely before he takes the next breath. It's also a ritual that if you look at any animal that's transitioning from one situation to the next, they do something. So a horse, when you see them flutter their lips and, and their lips, I guess, you know, do they have lips? When you see them, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, exactly, thank you, um, is that there's something that they're brushing off or there's some tension that they're brushing off. Mm -hmm. When you see an animal that's, that's just been, had to run or was almost attacked is that mm -hmm. they shake, right? And then they're, they're fine. Yeah. Your dog freaks out because Amazon's here and then goes back, circles, 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 and lies down again. Mm -hmm. So we don't have those rituals that have to do with like shaking it off. I mean, we have the words of like shake it off, walk it off, but we need to have more of that because we're, we're beings that need the discharge of that energy before we're told sit down mm -hmm. even more than we already sit.
which is, you know, we already know how much that is, and that's not good. Yeah. I've yeah. heard Andrew Huberman talk uh, quite a bit about the sigh. You know, we do this sigh, mm-hmm. we kind of sigh of relief. And uh, he mentioned that um, we do it a lot more than people think in some, in some studies. And I don't know what studies you're referring to, but I think he mentioned that people do it approximately like every five minutes or yeah. something without yeah. even really being aware of it. And I would imagine, again, maybe some people that are more anxious are probably doing it a little bit less uh, maybe they're not even even though it might be part of our subconscious. Maybe for them, maybe they're a little more locked up or something like that. So um, that's called a physiological sigh, and it is fascinating how quickly that goes to your brain and can calm you down. Mm-hmm. And what it is, and we can do it now, is you take a big belly breath, so a horizontal breath, and I'll go into you know whether belly is the right word or not later. So inhale, bottom of the body, and then you add a little bit to the top. And then you exhale. And that's an amazingly efficient reset. And that's what you're doing is that you're resetting your brain. It also is giving... You can sometimes even feel it in your head sometimes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes if you look at the emotional again, because I'm a psychologist, is that you look at a sigh and it usually means, um, okay, let's go. Like I'm going to transition from this to the other thing. Um, it can be a little bit of self-pity sometimes of like, oh, geez, really? Or it can be like, all right, well, this is the way things are. Let's move it along. But there's usually the breath has an emotional component to it as well. And when you look at the lungs is that when you take that breath, you're stretching things out. So your your lungs have been moving and then it's a stretch. Mm. And they need that. And they found that people that were in, in iron lungs, if that's the word, it was the – the containers that they yeah, put them in. Lung, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think we, there's just one person <clears throat> left in one if, if she hasn't died yet, is that when you didn't add the size to the iron lung, people would die. Wow. So the first bunch of people that were in them, um, everything was perfect, but they didn't have the sigh because we need it. We need that stretch of the lungs. So interesting you bring up that people who are anxious will actually sigh more, mm. more. I sometimes will notice... Uh, you know, I mentioned to you yesterday, I really try to pay attention to people's words. It's uh, important to me to uh, try to make my own progress. And so I try to pick up on uh, the way other people will speak sometimes. And I'm not afraid to uh, share my thoughts with people and say, hey, you said always, you said never. Like those are absolutes. And maybe you don't want to say those things, you know, uh, things of that nature. But what I have noticed with some people that I know that are a little bit more stressed, sometimes when you say, hey, how'd your day go? They go, <sighs> Yeah. And they do that, and then they they yeah. they, they unload on you, you yeah. know, with a lot of uh, usually uh, kind of uh, they have a negative perspective or interpretation of the day. Yeah, yeah, and that size a transition to tell you, but it's also again about like how tough their day was. So one oh, of the reasons they're kind of showing you, they're kind of like, is that right? Yeah. Like they're they're um, with their body, they're they're showing you like this day was fucking rough yeah. for me, and here's yeah. why. Yeah, they open up. Okay, you want to know? I'm going to open up the book, take a big sigh, and start to read. Right. <laughs> so, people who are sigh, who sigh too much, or who you notice, wow, you're sighing a lot. You know what's going on? Usually, are breath holders. Usually, are mm. breath holders. So, yes, um, there is a percentage of the population that overbreathes. It's about nine percent. But we also have a lot of the population that hover. Um, They take tiny little inhales, tiny little exhales, and breath hold. And breath holding has become actually quite a serious problem. And it happens because our screens are small. So Trying to focus. Yeah. So if you look out into the horizon, you will take a wider, bigger breath. And you will do it naturally. So next time you're at the beach, you look out into the distance, automatically you'll take a bigger breath and sigh. Once your screen starts getting smaller, you get into this modern predatory mode where you are hunting, right? Mm -hmm. And usually you crane your neck forward because you're trying to get there faster. It doesn't really work. It's the way I've always eaten because I had two older (laughs) brothers that would always eat like all my food. So I was being here tight, you know, like kind of looking out for your arms. Yeah, your arms like circling (laughs) your plate, right? (laughs) Yeah. So, and that's what you bring up is that it's really when you ask someone why they do why they're doing something is that you have to look at their history as a person. So, if you were to have really bad forward head posture, I would want to know where that came from because you can't just tell people, you know, breathe this way. 
stand this way. Do th- they won't listen. Like we're we're kind of lazy when it comes to things like that. Is mm-hmm. that we need to know? It's not lazy. It's that we need to know the why. If we're going to expend energy doing this, it better be for a good reason. So yeah. we're conserving energy. But I would talk to you about how many years did you spend hovering over your plate because of your brothers. And although it's a, it's a funny example, it's like if you spent 10 years protecting your plate with your head craned forward, like it's going to actually affect you as an adult. So asking those questions that seem to be psychological are really important when you're looking at breathing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we'll just have like my – I'll be making like a fist – and I'm not doing anything. And I'm like, what am I doing? Like, why don't I just fucking relax? Like, what's going on? Like, where's the threat? There's nobody around. There's, I don't know what. So I have to, like, kind of do that a lot where I just kind of yeah. sigh and relax. I yeah. don't feel like a stressed person, but yeah. uh, I'm sure there's things locked in there that I don't even know about. And again, like, if you're baseline, it's interesting because I've had people, when I first started doing this work as well, um, is that... My relaxed may not be relaxed for someone else, yeah, right? Yeah. How often do you have that friend where you're like relaxed and they're like, "I am relaxed." <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> hey, yeah. You know, a, you know a thing too, like the thing where you're mentioning the fists. I find myself like, I mean, I'm I'm way better at now, but I still catch myself kind of keeping some tension up in my traps. I'm like, "Fucking just drop your shoulders." Drop your shoulders, let yourself walk. Because like, there's an aspect of it, and we'll probably get into this. You know how people, you, you talk about how people hold their stomachs in. Mm-hmm. But also, people that are bigger, they tend to kind of like, just like, could go like that instinctually a little bit to just get a little bit taller, right? Or not even taller, but like look like they're bigger. So I'm just like, dude, fucking bring your shoulders down. Get that tension out because I hold a lot of tension in my traps. Yeah. So these are just little things that you, yeah, you can mentioned kind of pay that with, attention uh, running. to. You sometimes said you had to relax mm-hmm. your shoulders. Wait, especially when I started running, it's something I noticed because I was like, I was keeping up. I'm like, dude, fucking bring your shoulders down. Like, And that's something I had to remind myself, but it's been helpful because now daily life too, I can catch myself. And helps me be even more relaxed. And I'm out there in the sun, like running like this. And I'm like, <laughs> just, dude, just relax. <laughs> makes it so much easier when you relax. Makes yeah. it feel smoother. Yeah. But if someone's looking at you, they're like, oh, he's not trying hard enough. You know? <laughs> so, and this comes from if you did sports as a teenager, right? Is that you wanted people to know, your coach and other people, that you were trying really hard. Mm, yeah. So furrowed brow, you know, fists being as dramatic as possible because you wanted them to know you were doing a good job. But that is tapping into your energy. So when we talk about, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that got me interested in breath work was a book I read, uh, Let Every Breath. And it's about, it's Russian special operations training and their take on how to breathe. And that was a book that, weirdly enough, that was um, formative for me as far as changing from being a therapist to being a a coach. Uh, What was it called again? Sorry. Let every breath. Let every breath. breath. So, um, and they talk about how, they talk about um, things you can do with your breath to tolerate pain. um, But they also talk about how you need to be relaxed to conserve energy for when you need it. Yeah. So, and if you're tight, you're using up energy. And you know this from jujitsu is Mm. that... um, when you can be relaxed, especially when it comes to body weight distribution, is that if that you can be relaxed and heavy, mm-hmm. completely different. You got someone on top of you who knows body weight distribution. Actually, Henry Akins is is one of my favorite. Um, you definitely definitely need to talk to him. He's okay. kind of brilliant when it comes Akins. to body weight. Is that Henry feels like he's six hundred pounds, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And he's calm, like he's not <laughs> tight. And so anyway, is the. If you're going to conserve your energy for when you need it, you need to be able to switch from relaxed to explosive, to uh-huh. relaxed to explosive. And I think this translates to the gym in that nobody goes to relaxed. They go from lift heavy brace to brace a little bit left, a little bit less, yeah. and then go back to lift again. So we never go to the relax. And part of it is that we're so scared that if we relax, we won't be able to pick back up again. Like that, that relaxing can be a little scary. You no, know, that's why when I was uh, when I was focused on powerlifting, 
I loved watching Russians lift. Why the you know, there's always this US Russian rivalry, but the <laughs> Russians be ahead of shit, man. Because oh, like yeah. you watch them lift for some reason, people are like, oh, they're so stoic or they're so serious and they have no emotion. Well, <laughs> why are they lifting 900 pounds so fucking relaxed? <laughs> yeah. Like it looks like nothing, mm -hmm. right? There's an aspect to that. And that, like, I think uh Shaco talks about that shit in terms of like his lifters. He doesn't want them having any emotion, he doesn't want them hyping themselves up. He wants them to be able to be calm, approach the bar, lift it, and not have any resistance residual tiredness. For some reason, they seem like they can lift that over and over and over repetitively, and it's beautiful. Whereas you see some lifters who are still very strong, American lifters, don't get me wrong, and they're strong, I'm not trying to diss any American lifters, but they get off and they're just like fucking broken, right? Um, an example of actually uh, someone who does this really well is Russ Swole. We had him on the podcast before, but if you watch Russ lift heavyweights, he's talked about it. He's very chill. Yeah. His face looks like he's just like no emotion, mm -hmm. everything, no emotion, rep after rep after rep. And he seems to just recover really fucking well. So, hey, it's it's an aspect to it. So, and there's, again, it anatomically, it makes sense. Yeah. Because your brain takes um, cues from your jaw. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if your face is tight, is that your brain is going to be interpreting that a certain way. And there is one study um, that shows that when you're serious or angry, your nostrils are more narrow. So you're getting less air into your nos into your body. Mm. So the whole face tight and hands tight is that it's really hard to relax when you're gritting your teeth and when you're when your hands are tight. So to get someone to relax, really getting them to relax their face mm -hmm. and their hands is super important. Question about that real quick. You know how strong men, they'll, and, and some people who power lift, they'll use mouth, like there's a mm -hmm. brand called, yeah. I don't know, it's mouth, mouth guards, yeah. Mouth guard, there, there's a mouth guard brand for power lifters and strength mm -hmm. athletes. And it's so that like, you know, they, they say, that you know, when you lift more weight, to, to lift more weight, you want to clench your jaw against this. It'll allow you to produce more force. But there's, there's the opposite side of the spectrum. That's like relax your face because if you relax your face, you'll be able to zone in and lift more weight. What do you think is kind of like? Is there a, a both sides? Do they have some of it, or what's the answer there? And a lot of it is personal because um, although you know I love studies and I love numbers that and you know uh, mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. is that if you're an elite athlete and you're doing something that um, is specific to you and not uh, doesn't have a foundation in science, but it works for you, yeah. do it. I am not a purist in that way because so much of your performance has to do with your mental game. And if clenching your teeth or not clenching your teeth actually gets you a better lift, you know, don't change that. Mm. That works for you. So um, I would have to ask you what you do, Mark. Uh, so for me, um, I used to just make a lot of noise before I'd lift. I, I would, <laughs> I've heard this. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would breathe a lot. Um, I think Andrew's kind of looking for a clip. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm trying really like, hard. Bro. I would go to like our chalk bowl and basically yeah. play patty cake with the chalk bowl. It was sort of like a ritualistic yeah. kind of thing, but I don't know why it's in slow motion. But I don't know for me if it like pulled any more um, out of me than what is normal. But um, like I would sometimes, oftentimes, kind of pace back and forth, and I would breathe a lot. And uh, Smokey kind of does the same thing. He, he does uh, one of our lifters in the gym. I don't know if you can hear. And there's some smelling salts. <laughs> but I don't know. This probably doesn't have. No, it doesn't yeah, have like, audio. Like so when he does that, he's like, let me it. <laughs> like it's, yeah. it sounds like yeah. that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yep. fucking crazy. Yeah, it sounds like you're letting a lot of air out of a tire. And then I would breathe the same way when I was lifting. So once I actually went into the lift, I would, uh, you know, take air in and I'd, you know, breathe the air out as I'm going and trying to be explosive. So it was a way for me to like jog my memory and uh, kind of jog my brain through what I was about to go through. So that's, that's a brilliant answer. Okay. Is that you practice the breath that you were going to do when you did the movement right before it. Mm -hmm. So it was almost like prepping your body for that with your breath and you were prepping your brain as well. Cause like remember your brain looks at it. So fantastic. Um, and those are the questions you have to ask is like, why are you breathing that way? And what does it do for you? Um, and I felt good. Uh, yeah. Like I personally felt good turned up. Maybe yep. not everybody feels good that way. Maybe some people feel like I'm drawing too much attention or maybe it's distracting to them. But for mm. me, it always felt good. Yeah. I, I kind of also felt like, uh, you know, I've been powerlifting my whole life. I got uh, 60 to 90 seconds 
to be in front of everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, let's make this a fucking thing. You know, let's, Excellent. let's make this fun. Yeah. And, and people would get fired up with me. So, yeah. So check this out. This is great. Go, go, go. Let's go. Mm. Wrapping those wrists up tight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Come on. Right now. Come on. Right now. Let's go. Let's go. Come on, Let's go, Let's go, Sounds like an air compressor. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go, Mark. <laughs> there we go green lights yeah so good i got goosebumps oh cool. yeah yeah mm. yeah so what like let me ask you this with that type of breathing what's going on you're up regulating so you're waking yourself up and if you think about um you think about your arousal in a in a curve mm. right uh is that you want to be in different places depending on what you're doing yeah. um and you also, that's what your breathing does is it keeps you, it's called yurks, uh, I forgot the second word, but it's, an, it's, it's a curve that has to do with arousal. Now, you don't want to be too much to the left and you definitely don't want to be too much to the right. Mm-hmm. If you're to the left, you're kind of numb. You can't get yourself to perk up. You know the feeling, right? Mm-hmm. The middle is when you're in the zone and you're doing well and your breath is connected. And to the right is when you're in the black, David Grossman calls, uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman calls it, in the black. Mm-hmm. And that's when you don't have control. So, for instance, in that lift, you want to be slightly to the right, but still within the zone because you don't want to mm-hmm. lose control. Yeah, I've gone too far yeah. before yeah. where I, like, cried and, like, it had opposite impact. Yeah. I was like, that wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> that was crappy. Yeah. yeah, that wasn't good. So, um, with the breath, you are pumping yourself up or you're getting yourself excited um, and focused and aggressive in a place that's very narrow on that curve. And to me if I was to work with you, is that I would want to make sure that that was replicable so that you know what you're doing and you can do it over and over and over again exactly the same. Because Mm. most of us, especially with someone who's elite, is that you do it because it comes naturally, but you don't really know what you're doing. And I've had some great conversations with folks who are really elite to see what they're doing. So I could now take it and go like, for us common people, what are those folks doing that we need to be able to learn? Mm. So, for instance, golf is a game that has no breathing in it at all. And part of it is cultural. So I do CrossFit. um, I also golf. And part of the reason I golf is – and it took a little while for it to get me (laughs) to get to the golf course um, because it didn't feel like a – Sport. Didn't feel like real <laughs> <laughs> but it's a precision sport, right? Yeah. And I'm writing a chapter about precision sports. I'm writing about shooting, about archery, about billiards, about golf. So I have to go out there and try this because I'm going to be writing about it. And um, you ask great golfers what they do, and they'll say, oh, I, I do this, that, and the other thing. Do you do it every single time? So your natural elite athlete will do it every single time exactly the same. But the first question to ask is, what are you doing exactly, and do you do it every single time? Because then your performance shouldn't change. Mm-hmm. And most in most sports, what's interesting is that we're obsessed with uh, repetitions and practice and training, but the one element that we haven't focused on is the breath. So it's this, it's kind of a secret thing um, that hasn't been worked on. So how good would your performance be if you threw the breath into that? Mm. So for instance, you obviously are a fantastic athlete. Your age, you're at the pinnacle of your breathing, being 29. Um, your mechanics it's get gonna better. It's going to be 30 soon. It's going to be mm. 30? Oh, okay. Very soon to be 30 years oh. old. I ain't going to look it for another gonna, 10 years now. It's going to be old. <laughs> Old, 30. <laughs> Remember when 30 was old? Yeah. <laughs> when I get to be, you always have these things about when you get to be 30. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm. Missed all of those. <laughs> <laughs> is that you take as good as you are at what you do, and now you actually get your mechanics to be an A and get mm. your breathing muscles to be crazy strong. What happens to your performance? 
that's what's fascinating to me. Yeah. Because endurance isn't just cardiovascular. Endurance is cardiovascular and respiratory conditioning. And we haven't been, we've completely omitted the respiratory conditioning. And that to me is, a, is, is crazy because you do cardio, it's your heart, mm -hmm. right? So what about your breathing muscles? You have 10 pounds of breathing muscles and you're omitting that from the equation. So endurance uh, is, has to have those two elements, um, working out, getting the mechanics and your breathing muscles strong and the cardiovascular. Then you have optimal endurance. I have a question that I think actually ties into this, and it, it was something that I was talking to Mark about after I read your book, because when you were talking about, and you'll, you'll definitely explain the muscles of breathing, how vertical breathers, muscles here, and et cetera, but hopefully I can, hopefully this question can be formulated in a way that makes sense, because even if I was talking to Mark about it, I'm like, I don't know if this can make sense, but you know when, when you breathe, right? And let's say you're breathing through your nose, you start your breath here. And yeah, it ends up expanding here. But as I was reading your book, I'm like, what if I just, just focus on just moving the muscles here while a breath happens, right? So what if I like, and I'm, I was curious, is there any advantage with, do you get what I'm saying by starting the breath with the muscles, not with, not with taking the breath, but instead moving the muscles to breathe? Do you, is there a difference or is there an advantage? I understand what you're saying. And, yeah. and when you take a breath, even though it doesn't feel like your muscles are activating, mm -hmm. they are. Mm -hmm. Because there's no way to take a breath without your external intercostals or your diaphragm moving. Yeah. Okay. Or your neck and shoulders pulling your rib cage up. Mm -hmm. So something is happening to get the air in. It's not just like, it feels like your nose is doing something, right? Yeah. Your nose is not doing anything. Actually, the muscles um, have to be working. And sometimes it's a very, very small movement and you don't feel it because you don't have um, nerve endings on your diaphragm. Mm -hmm. So you don't feel your diaphragm fatigue. You don't feel the burn that you do with other muscles. Yeah. So um, when you actually move your body and you feel and you make your muscles expand and contract your body, then it's going to be a bigger breath and it's going to be a more efficient breath. And that for an athlete is super important, especially when it comes to recovery, is is this breath efficient? Mm -hmm. Especially when if you're doing your sport, maybe you breathe 15 times a minute, I'm sorry, 15 times a minute in daily life. And in your sport, you're going to go up to what, 50, 60, maybe 70? Yeah. So you want efficiency as far as your breath. And I'm, I'm curious too, I'm curious, Mark, if you've noticed any difference when you're in any of your runs, but I, I noticed there was a run that I did after I was like, okay, let me try. Cause okay. When I breathe, I usually breathe and it ends up here, but let me just try initiating the breath with the musculature. That's mm -hmm. what I was trying on a run. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this feels less stressful for some reason for like, for some reason, it feels like I can continue this run for longer than I typically could by focusing the breath is going to the same place, but it's like initiating from mm -hmm. here rather than feeling like it's initiating from here, if that makes sense. I love that. Now does, but is what I'm saying, is that just, is that just a feeling? Like, am I totally putting false correlations there or is there something to what's going on with, with that? So when you move the middle of your body, and again, what I'm talking about really is that your diaphragm is flattening and pushing your ribs open mm -hmm. and pushing the middle of your body open in some way, is that the pull of air is coming from the middle of your body, okay? Mm -hmm. Rather than you taking some air because you're using, you know, some muscles to pull the rib cage up a little bit. So I say this is that smokers actually are better diaphragmatic breathers. Hey, okay? let's start smoking, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it's because they actually feel the suction and they understand how to get the suction um, that feeling of taking a deep breath, you're mm -hmm. pulling the air in deeper into your body. So yes, the air goes throughout your lungs, but if you breathe in a shallow way, it only is the top part of your lungs. Starting to explain my wife uh, breathes so well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because she's a swimmer. <laughs> she's a swimmer. I was like, I Swimmers do have a great breathing. Some, yeah. Something I noticed uh, with uh, what he's saying is sometimes if, like, once we try, <laughs> then we tend to kind of screw things up. <laughs> we, like, observe, and then we, I don't know, we somehow screw things up when we start to think about it more. And I noticed um, 
for myself sometimes if I'm thinking like, oh, I'm going to take a deep breath in my nose, I'm immediately going to move my chest and shoulders. Um, but if as we're standing here, I was just trying to observe like, how am I kind of actually breathing? Mm -hmm. like, let me just keep my hands on my stomach for a moment. Mm -hmm. And I've done this before, like just try to keep them there for kind of a long time to really mm -hmm. observe even when I'm sitting down and stuff like that. And a lot of times it is, you know, my belly is moving. One thing I have noticed though too is sometimes it's hard to really relax the stomach. And I don't know if that's because uh, I'm trying to stabilize my back or just because I'm standing or sometimes walking. I'm not sure exactly what that is. But as we're standing, uh, what do you believe is like good posture in general? I know it's a loaded statement because of all the different um, everyone's body is a little bit different, but in general, uh, a kind of a universal rule. Is there some universal rules that we should try to be following? So, um, this isn't this is something I read from someone else named Blandine Kelly's. Um, she has a beautiful book. Um, I think it's called "The Art of Breathing" or, or "Breathing" or you know something with breathing in it. It's it's hard to have a book title about breathing that's that's actually interesting. This is the moral of the story. You know, my books included because they sound like that. But um, is that she divided this in a way that made so much sense to me is that you have an anatomical breath and you have a mechanical breath, okay? And I simplified it further because I like simplifying things is that there's the breath you're taking when you're walking around and moving and doing things and there's the breath that you take at the gym two completely different things that you're doing. So an anatomical breath is one pretty much that when you extend your body, when you're opening up, is that you're going to inhale. Your body wants to do that. And even in utero, when babies are starting to stretch to try to practice a uh, third trimester, is that in, um, when you extend, that's an inhale. And when you exhale, you sort of curl up. Mm. So inhale, exhale. And that's that's what your body needs to do. That's what you want to do. So when people talk about one posture for breathing, um, yes, when you're in the gym and you're practicing a mechanical breath, your diaphragm and your pelvic floor need to be stacked. That zone of opposition, you know, um, uh, that's tremendously important. But however, in your walk-a-day life is that your body's pulsating. So you have your, your stomach, there's peristalsis happening, right? You have your heart moving, your lungs are moving. Is that the last thing I want is your posture to be something that doesn't move. Mm. I want your body moving. I want inhale. I want you to have a tiny little bit of a anterior pelvic tilt. And on the exhale, I want you to be have a tiny bit of, of an exhale and a posterior pelvic tilt. Like not super crazy. Like when you're learning, it's going to look kind of nuts, right? Mm -hmm. But later on is that, Inhale, your glutes are relaxed, your pelvic floor is relaxed. You may have a tiny tip of your hips. And on the exhale, you know, you should be narrowing your body and you may have a tiny bit of a posterior pelvic tilt. So there should be movement. There isn't one posture that I want you to have. Mm. And part of the, the problem, you know, part of the reason we have so many lower back problems is because there isn't movement in the vertebrae when there should be. So if you are a vertical breather, it means that your spine is not getting this movement it needs to have the fluid that's that's healthy moving through it. So that's kind of a long-winded uh, mm -hmm. answer. I hope. No, that's <laughs> I great. hope I got there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. so there isn't one posture. Although I do have to say that when you're in the gym, and there are people who who specialize in this, um, DNS and, and PRI. Um, and I mean, I have my favorite folks who can explain that you need to have a very specific posture when you're lifting. Oh, yeah. if, if you're going to have um, the strength and the and the the stability, the stiffness that you need, your ribs have to be over and stacked with your pelvis. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a vertical breather trying to figure that out, like, do you know what that feels like? Are you scissors open most of the time? Mm -hmm. Or are you a rib gripper? So you have all these people, you try to get someone who is a rib gripper, which is that person and look around Shoulders you. are kind of forward. Yeah. Shoulders, but more than anything is that the ribs are squeezing into the body. Mm. Now, they're completely that's, yeah, that's not uncomfortable a good posture. even just to yeah. go to I almost, almost but, hurt myself <laughs> but look around is that you'll find you know go oh no how do i get that person to actually be able to move so that now they're stacked mm -hmm. right it's it's harder than the person who's what's called scissors open that you're trying to 
bring the ribs down. Yeah. Now, you leave the gym, please move your body to breathe, you know, depending on if you're holding something, if you're stretching, if you're in the car, like you're in all different, you should be moving all different ways and your breath should be changing with it. Mm -hmm. And there's also, I would imagine, um, depending on like what your parents do and what you saw as a kid, right? And you see your brothers maybe breathing the same way. Uh, maybe you have family members that are all in sports or maybe you have the exact opposite in your household. Maybe you have a dad that uh, has a nine to five. He can't get off uh, work for vacations or has hardly any downtime. Maybe he's overly stressed and you kind of see the way he breathes. Mm -hmm. You see the way he eats, you see the way he walks. And maybe it's uh, all stuff that uh, makes it very difficult for you to be on a healthier path. Absolutely. And as a kid, you look at superheroes. Show me one superhero. Yeah, exactly, right? Show me one superhero that's a diaphragmatic breather. And the superheroes, actually, <laughs> we have uh, one of our friends here uh, who I don't know if you'll meet because he's probably not going to be back in time, but Graham Tuttle. He's uh, the barefoot sprinter. Mm. And we were watching something at my house, and we're just sitting there. Everyone's just, like, enjoying this, like, uh, superhero movie. I can't remember which one it was. And he's just sitting there and he's folding his hands over and he's just looking at everybody. He's like, I can't watch this. He's like, look at these guys. They're all mouth breathers. <laughs> he's like, this is terrible. He's like, can't, can't they shut their mouth and like breathe it out of their nose? <laughs> and then no one else really, except for me, knew what the hell he was talking about. But it was really funny. You know, I have a hard time watching movies as well because I will go, <laughs> that's not, you know, that's not someone who's bipolar. That's not someone who's schizophrenic. Mm. You know, that's not someone who's hallucinating. So right. I'm a pain in the ass to go to the movies with as well because <laughs> I sit there and I analyze but if, for if acting purposes, like, they probably need to like you know amplify the yeah. situation, right? Yeah. So Batman needs to stand there with his arms out, and sure. he needs to be, <gasps> yeah, like something important happened, I guess. Yeah, something important, and that's again, you know, when I see someone like this, a a lot of it is, um, you know, bravado. All right, because we live in a, you know, we live in a dangerous place. Either as far as and Sima has or... no idea what you're talking about. What, the, what are you talking about? What? Right? Uh, no belly. <laughs> <laughs> Just always doing a vacuum everywhere. <laughs> vacuum everywhere. Vacuum. We need a T-shirt. Vacuum everywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but that that corset, that emotional corset, mm -hmm. or it's a muscular corset. So your obliques are either so tight. Um, that you can't take a breath, so that's the muscular corset, or you're so stressed and you're, you're prepared, right? When you're going to go into a meeting or go into a competition or something, you automatically get into this stance where you're braced. So that's normal, okay? Um, however, if your day continues that way, so you're constantly braced, is that that's not good. Mm -hmm. That's not good. And we live in a world where it's one thing after another, one thing after yeah. another. So you consciously have to go, okay, wait, let me actually relax my middle, inhale and exhale. So I actually want to go back to the belly breath because mm -hmm. I do say belly and a lot of people bristle with that because the air is not going into your belly because I've had people say, um, you know, am I, am I going to get gassy breathing <laughs> my belly? You know, nothing really happens with your belly. But because of the position, you brought this up, Mark, because of the position of your diaphragm, which is slightly leaning backwards, is that if the, uh, the curl part of the diaphragm, which is the middle, if that's going to descend, it means that the middle part of your body needs to soften, okay? So it's a belly breath um, for you to be able to take a good breath. So I see a lot of folks that stay braced, but then they move their ribs, that's not a diaphragmatic breath. Those are your intercostals and the coastal part of your diaphragm opening up your rib cage. Mm. A true diaphragmatic breath is abdominothoracic. And that's why the breathing IQ that I do looks at the bottom of your ribs moving and your belly moving. Now, if you're going to breathe behind this shield, so if you're going to do a farmer's carry, you're going to do something where you have to stay braced in front, how are you going to breathe? You have to learn how to breathe through your sides and even through your back. So you can take a really good deep breath, and you might want to try this right now, where you inhale and you round your back, and then you exhale. And think about, just in your mind's eye, squeezing your shoulder blades together and your, and your pos uh, straightest posterior and, like, the back squeezing. But you can take a great breath mm. through your back. 
because your is lungs. Is that what the doctor's looking at with the stethoscope thing or listening? Yeah, okay. So they're listening to you know what the sounds they don't want are. To sound, they don't want to hear like an obstruction of some kind. They exactly. Want nice and clear. Nice and clear lungs, I guess. But think about it: when you were a kid, and doctor comes over and does. Mm-hmm. Then you go. <gasps> yeah. So <laughs> yeah. so what do you think? You're like, oh, they said take a deep breath, mm-hmm. and they put the stethoscope up here. Mm-hmm. So my lungs must be up here. And actually, I know my lungs are up here because my superheroes and my mom and my dad <laughs> breathe like. So this is how <laughs> this whole thing starts to fall apart. Yeah. Is that stethoscope up there? My lungs must be here. They just told me to breathe. I see everybody breathing this way. Um, life is complicated. I start tensing my belly. Breathe lower. Breathe into your balls. Yeah, breathe into <laughs> your balls. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, there. You know what? I'll, I have the FP thing for. I want you to kind of explain maybe what you've been learning from mm-hmm. that and kind of what he mentions about breathing because I'm curious about the difference in thought. But when it comes to this, we'll keep it on the fitness side for a bit. Within like fitness, people want to keep their abs tight. Hmm. People want to perpetually be lean. Like you look, you see in shows, I mean, I know friends who are bikini athletes and their coaches want them to train in, <laughs> in waist trainers. Y'all shut your mouths, bro. <laughs> Don't say nothing. Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing at Mark posing back there. But, the- <laughs> but I know friends who are bikini athletes and their coaches like have them, like want them to train in those because they don't want the obliques to become too developed over time. It's all about the look, right? But that also causes that upper breathing. So I'm curious, like, if somebody's within that, how can they rectify, make sure that they're breathing well, but also make sure that they can show up where they need to show up as far as competition? So you answered this question um, on a podcast or on a YouTube video a while back about compromise, mm-hmm. right? Is that all with all sports is that there's a compromise in what movements will be affected by your sport. Um, and also the time in your day. So am I going to not have time to do other things? Um, When you're wearing a waist trainer is that you're trying to get those muscles not to develop and not to move, Mm. right? Because it makes for a more beautiful shape in our eyes. Mm. I get it. I get it. Um, And again, you know, if I'm wearing something that's tight-fitting, um, and going out, I am holding in my gut the whole entire time. I'm not saying I'm breathing diaphragmatically or belly breathing if I have something tight on. Absolutely not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But um, that's one of those compromises that, that, you're, that you want to make, that you have to make, is that if you want your waist to look like that, it's not a normal shape. I mean, for some people, some you know girls are lucky enough that that shape is the shape they are normally. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Um, but again, I look at some of the girls in, in my CrossFit community, and we're just straight down. And that's kind of how I'm shaped. I'm like straight down. Uh, and, I, you know, if you put me in a waist trainer for long enough, I probably would have um, a smaller waist. But do I want that? And, and what's the trade-off? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, okay. again, one of the things I worry about with waist trainers is not only is your breath going to go up to your shoulders because it's the only place it can, mm-hmm. is that that's going to make you anxious. So what's your anxiety baseline? Do you yeah. have people in your family who have anxiety? Are you prone to anxiety? Because now if you're wearing a waist trainer, you're definitely going to get anxious because you're breathing in a way that that makes you more anxious. Mm-hmm. And then at the other end of the spectrum is that what's happening with your pelvic floor. Because if you squeeze something in the middle, so take your toothpaste and squeeze it in the middle, it's going to go up and it's going to go down. So what's going on with your pelvic floor? All right. Mark, we I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> the pelvic floor thing, man, y- y'all have seen this. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday. Now, some people, I guess, do have issues. But, you know, when sometimes you'll see powerlifting videos um, of w- certain women and you, you'll, you know, like, OK, well, she's about to deadlift. We know the platform's about to get wet. Mm-hmm. Right now, some some of them say there's nothing that can be done about it gone to doctors there's really nothing to do because it's just what happened when you lift heavy weights is that the case though is that really is there really nothing they can do to strengthen that area so they don't pee on the platform and i'm not dissing that i don't want to be i'm not dissing them but uh, it it seems like it's a situation that nobody wants they don't want to have that happen no one wants to have it happen but but can that be addressed and fixed so it doesn't happen so two-part answer and the first part is that if you have lower back pain, any kind of hip issue, Mm -hmm. um, any kind of pelvic floor issue, you have to see a pelvic floor physical therapist. 
We have them in the United States. Usually it's not covered by insurance because, you know, insurance and, you know, people do not care. Industry does not care about the pelvic floor. Um, In other countries, it is absolutely covered by insurance and people are encouraged. So this is a very American thing is that um, Australia, the UK, you go to a pelvic floor physical therapist. It's covered. It's normal. Here, absolutely not. So if you have anything going on, hips, lower back, um, incontinence issues, pain, any kind mm-hmm. of pelvic floor pain, pelvic floor physical therapist. And it is um, a very intimate uh, um, appointment, okay? Um, and uh, so it can't be done from the outside. If you go to someone who's a pelvic floor specialist and they're only looking at you from the outside, yeah. they're kind of missing the point. So that's not okay. But a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction doesn't come from a weak pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. It could be a tight pelvic floor. So how many muscles in your pelvic floor? 20. 20 muscles. That's the small and the the, the very small and the the outside. 20 muscles in your pelvic floor. And again, um, it's your bicycle seat. So all that part of your body that hits the bicycle seat, that's your pelvic floor. Super important. So usually when I talk to people, and the first time I talk about the pelvic floor regardless of who the audience is because we all have one. Yeah. So I remember I was at um, DOD, the Department of Defense, working with DEA and, and uh, first responders there. And I asked – this was about 10 years ago. I asked the group – it was mostly men – who had a pelvic floor? And I kid you not <laughs> – I'd say 80% of the group went no, and a few guys, you know, raised their eyebrows and did this movement. I'm like, (laughs) oh, no, all right? And then I said, well, what is the pelvic floor? I had two or three guys go like, oh, you know, vagina, pelvic floor. Like, I don't have one of those. Yeah, exactly. You can do Kegels too. (laughs) You can (laughs) and should and should. So um, if you have anything going on with your pelvic floor, you have to see someone, and they go, whether it's for a woman or for a man, they go up and in, Okay. They go up and in. So, um, you know, not the funnest appointment. Or it could be. Could be. (laughs) (laughs) I knew you were going to get (laughs) it. But you need to see someone. And again, doing Kegels is not, uh, especially when you have someone who's super fit and muscular, the probability that it's muscles that are too tight is much higher. So don't go doing Kegels. It's actually you need to find trigger points and get those muscles to let go. Yeah, yeah. And again, here comes the compromise is that uh, if you're leaking when you lift, is that it's a very slippery slope, is that it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. So, so, so people lifting like deadlifting 500, women deadlifting 500, 600 pounds, that's some crazy weight. Is yeah. Are you saying like at that point there's really minimal way to improve it unless there's a bit of a back off period dealing with the pelvic floor, then going back? To that weight? Yes. And I mean, how many, we don't talk about this enough. Um, I was in the gym the other day and there's a guy and he had just had a hernia um, fixed uh, pelvic floor Mm. and he's lifting. And I said, did they tell you, you know, uh, did they let you lift? You know, how soon did you have stitches there, right? Mm. There's, there was a, something that needed to be fixed and now you're pressuring down. He's like, no, no one told me anything. I'm like, this is you're going to be back in there again. And then they're going to want to put mesh in there and metal and all kinds of things to like hold things up. And that's, that's really tough. Uh, Are, is the pelvic floor, is it like only like the pee muscles or is it like peeing and pooping? (laughs) Like, like how specific? Cause like there's, Many different controls down yeah. there, you know? Yeah, there are. There's a lot of controls down there. There's <laughs> X, a lot X, of y, y. <laughs> <laughs> So it's all those muscles. So once you get good at Kegels, you can actually draw a quadrant and you can squeeze the top half and you can squeeze the bottom half and you can actually mm. go in quadrants. Look, he's doing it. I can tell. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me uh, back up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> So, Uh, yeah, is that it's all the muscles all the way around. So when you go in for an appointment and they go up and in, right, and I'm doing the up and in, is that you will act, I went because, again, 
if I'm going to tell people to go, I need to see what it feels like, yep. right? So, and I remember the physical therapist saying like, oh, here's your bladder. I'm going to need to move that over. That shouldn't be there. I'm like, okay, well, that's good. And then hitting a point where I was like, whoa, what is that? And she's like, oh, that muscle's way too tight. And then hitting another muscle and going, yeah, we have to strengthen that one. I'm like, whoa. wow, this is crazy. This is like the Starship Enterprise down there. We really need to get this coordinated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And especially when it comes to lower back pain, if you go again up and in, you're at your lower back. You're at your like your coccyx and and the very bottom of your spine. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's related to it. So I would say go to a pelvic floor physical therapist. You might have to back off, but I understand. Like if you're if you're going to have a a great PR. It's hard to like care about pee in that moment. You're just like, I mm. really like, and this makes me so happy to be able to lift this much. Like mm. it's hard to to think about what it's might be breaking. So yeah, yeah. Ben, I guess Ben Greenfield was right. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> what? Saying, we had him on the show, and he said he was like, uh, he shoved that thing up his butt, and he was like on his bathroom. That's floor. right. Yeah, <laughs> one of the guys we had on the show. It would yeah. electric. Like he, he would, has like a like massager a, or something. It's like right? a tens unit for his anus. Mm. Yeah. 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 Great guy. Sounds different. <laughs> <laughs> but, you got to have some questions over there, Andrew, right? Uh, well, yeah. in regards to the, uh, like the, what we're just talking about right now, like, so when I really can allow myself to release as much of my body as I can, cause I've been dealing with my back for, for a while now. Um, so when we're like yesterday, when we were down on the floor and it takes me a while, but like, when you're like, you know, um, relax your glutes and like really start to fall into it. When I take a big belly breath, my back will actually pop pretty hard. And then it's like kind of okay, but then I'm kind of stuck there. What's going on? So again, I refer out to people all the time. Um, I know the breath. I'm a psychologist. I know the psychology behind it. Mm -hmm. I can pretty much work with anyone um, and figure it out and teach anyone because the words and the cueing are so important to me. Um, so with, with back, I would send you to... One of my favorite back people, I would send you to, like I said, Stu McGill, who would tell you what's going on there. So mm -hmm. I definitely don't try to uh, be everything to everyone, no especially if I didn't go to school for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But again, what you have to think about is that we don't move our backs as much as we should. And that that diaphragmatic breath is, is one that is really helpful to the spine. Mm -hmm. um, and... We're braced so much that there isn't the movement and our, all those muscles are probably overused because you don't need to be as braced as, as much as you think you are yeah. um, outside of the gym. Yeah, because so, I, I definitely yeah. like spent my entire life basically up until fairly recently uh, just breathing up here. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've had back pain for quite some time. So even just like when you're telling us to exhale and like really curl into it, mm -hmm. like that's pretty painful. Like mm -hmm. it actually will yeah. kind of trigger some some pain there. Yeah. But then going the opposite feels amazing, especially yeah. some of the stretches that you were showing us. Yeah. Um, can you explain some of those stretching, like the like the sure all that good stuff? Because those felt incredible. Yeah, uh, you know it's wild, and is I'll I'll work with folks, and I don't see people one on one that much anymore. I teach teachers, so I teach coaches, I teach anybody who works with humans in some way. Mm. I teach them because I can't be everywhere all the time. And appreciate I, all the time you spent with us yesterday oh, too. That was you. awesome. You had such good questions. You were so enthusiastic about mm -hmm. it. Like it was just hard. It's so nice to be around. When I first started this, people would laugh. Like you're teaching, breathe. my mom was just, <laughs> you're doing what? Like, yeah. You're, so. you're selling bottled water? Yeah, like what's going on with really? that? <laughs> uh. So to have folks be excited about it mm -hmm. is so great is so great because otherwise you're really lonely with your weird <laughs> thing that you're teaching people and and you know it's now cool and trendy so hopefully uh it'll keep being that way mm -hmm. um so you have to think about you can have really great lungs and actually you have you have a very long rib cage mm -hmm. so if your thoracic cavity becomes a rib cage is that you can have great lungs but you're actually not going to fill them so getting your rib cage to be flexible is possibly the most important thing you can do. I mean, having hamstrings not be tight is really important for your body, but your rib cage being flexible, I'd say is the number one most important uh, point of flexibility in your body. And again, T-spine, people are so tight in the top of their body. When you ask them to twist, it's all at the waist, which again, you know, destabilizes you. But T-spine, top of the body, you need to be able to turn around without your ribs turning as well, right? And again, if you can't do that, you're prey. Mm. 
So it's important for you to be able to look behind you because otherwise you're prey. Um, and we have gotten to the point as modern humans that um, our rib cage is so tight. So think about the muscles that are in between your ribs. So if you eat ribs, that rib meat, mm -hmm. the muscles that, that – and usually I use a lot of food analogies in general. So mm -hmm. the rib cage is a pizza – um, or a skirt steak, which it actually is. Um, but those little muscles between your ribs are super tight. And you should be able to stick your thumb. So take your thumb and go to one of the bottom ribs and stick your thumb in between there and stick it in there hard, is that there should be movement in between your ribs. Because think about it, when you inhale and tip over and do that intercostal stretch, you want those ribs to open up as much as possible. Because if you were to go straight in, there is the densest, most oxygen-rich part of your lungs. So if that part of your body doesn't move, mm -hmm. then you're not, you're not getting there, right? And that's going to happen when your diaphragm flattens out and you allow it to open up. Yeah. So with a lot of folks who have a breathing IQ, which is the measurement I do around the outside of the body, and they don't have good range of motion, often it's those intercostal muscles and those obliques that are so tight, they're not letting go. Mm. Fat Project fam, this episode is brought to you by Vivo Barefoot Shoes. We've been wearing these shoes for almost a year now. They're flexible. They have a wide toe box. They allow your feet to get connected to the ground, and they will make your feet stronger. And they don't look like shit like a lot of these other barefoot <laughs> shoes. Andrew, how can they get them? For the best barefoot shoes on the planet, and they also look really, really good, <laughs> head over to VivoBarefoot.com slash Power Project. At checkout, enter promo code Power Project 20 to save 20% off. Again, VivoBarefoot.com slash Power Project, promo code Power Power Project 20 to save 20% off. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Let's go ahead and get back to this podcast. I have a kind of an odd question. Since you've observed so many different bodies and so many different types of people breathe, you know, like one observation that people have about certain ethnicities is like, for example, black people typically have longer Achilles tendons and smaller calves. Mm -hmm. One thing people notice about Asian people as just a general population is they have big calves, right? Just like a lot of them tend to have big calves. So when, you know, when you were noticing Andrew's rib cage yesterday and you said, wow, you have a long rib cage, it just got me thinking, are there just general potential ethnic differences between, and I'm just wondering, just observational, maybe if you've seen anything mm -hmm. between like rib cage size or whatever, have you not noticed any type of thing? Like everybody's different in that way. So there is a difference, um, with gender. Oh, okay. I can tell you that. Um, and the difference, when I think about culture, I think about cultures that don't mind, that don't have you bracing all the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, for in, I'll say, for instance, is, um, you know, I was in, I'm Cuban, mm -hmm. and Cuban and Serbian, and I was in Puerto Rico and talking to a friend of mine who is curvy but also has a belly. And she had just moved there from the United States. And she's like, this is amazing. Like, I don't have to suck in my gut because mm -hmm. guys don't mind, you know, that I have a little bit of belly fat. They actually think it's sexy, you know? <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. So <laughs> a lot of it is cultural. Like, it depends on where you're from mm -hmm. and is that okay or not? Mm. So are you beating yourself up because you don't have this, this, particular shape yeah so i think culturally that's pretty interesting when you go to countries where you know my 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 female brazilian friends um and again there's no judgment all have fake boobs because you do that's what you do it's easy to get them and it's just it's a cultural thing mm -hmm. all right so i think the differences in culture as far as what you do to your body and and what's considered beautiful is really fascinating yeah yeah okay yeah with men and women Again, I always like the comparisons I like to make is primitive man um, and modern man. And, and man, I mean human. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Got yourself. Before anybody, you know, gets mad yeah. at me. Um, more hate mail. <laughs> more hate mail. Yeah. Oh, God damn. And, uh, and then men and women. So um, in men and women, women tend to be more vertical breathers. Okay. And it's because of the position of their rib cage. So their ribs are actually slanted more. Okay. Mm. And the reason is because their body's set up to be able to have a mm. fetus and be able to breathe with a fetus in it. Yeah. Okay. That's just what it is. Um, men tend to have their ribs uh, be in a more horizontal position. Mm. So I find that pretty fascinating that 
you know, already you have a difference in the way you breathe and it what it affects. Yeah. Right. Um, primitive man had stronger diaphragms, bigger diaphragms, uh, more lung capacity. They were more back breathers. They had wider nostrils mm. and they had less innervation to the intercostals. And that's the one I really love. So they had less control over their intercostals. Their, I'll give you a hint, internal intercostals. Any idea why? Mm -hmm. Mark, you so would get this. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Internal intercostals are the exhale, squeezing together, controlling, controlling, controlling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why do we need that? Because our sentences are so much longer than they were when we were primitive man and grunting. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Yeah. Okay. So, that's really cool. pretty fascinating. So, when I work with people who present um, and have anxiety over that, usually the anxiety is, um, they don't know this, but it is that I'll run out of breath halfway through a sentence and that it'll feel like I wilt and then I won't have enough air to get to the end of the sentence. Mm. That's what really freaks you out. So next time you speak in public, do that and watch how like <gasps> your anxiety goes mm -hmm. up immediately. Now, if you don't have a good breathing IQ and you don't uh, have a big breath that you can use when you know you're gonna have a long sentence, mm -hmm. um, that's what I work on, is let's get that exhale to be something you control, control, control. So I don't do breath holds, but I do something called extended exhales, where you see how slowly you can get the air to leave your body and in a controlled way. Why would a primitive man, human, uh, be back breathers? Like what was in their mechanics that mm. would make that happen? Think about it. Think about it a second. Were they standing up all, all the time? Like us? Uh, Squatters. Big squatters, okay. right? You spent a lot of time on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know, you spent a lot of time in a squat position. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to breathe through your back. And you it can is. try this right now or next time you get into yeah. just a squat as a, as a sitting yeah. posture is that your back opens up. So mm -hmm. there you go. Inhale and exhale. And it actually, we have really good lung real estate in the back of our bodies. Mm -hmm. Is that, And we don't use it, especially if we're posturing this mm -hmm. way you know, in a, in a chest forward breath is that we're squeezing all that good uh, real estate in the back and, of our uh, body. No back support. Yeah. Like not a lot of chairs, right? Exactly. Yeah. Not a lot of chairs. <laughs> Maybe just sitting down on the floor <laughs> yeah. and stabilizing yourself that yeah. way. So the stabilization, you've brought this up a couple of times. And um, one of the things, I, and again, I am obsessed with the musculature of, of the breath and the psychology is that your diaphragm is your main muscle of respiration, but it's also your main muscle of balance. So breathing diaphragmatically is going to help your balance. Um, and there is a study that shows that when you breathe vertically with auxiliary muscles, you're more prone to knee and ankle injuries. But again, think about it when uh, you watch, and again, you know I'm, I'm an MMA fan, is that someone's super tired, the round ends, and usually if they're really tired, they go over to the side of uh, the ring and hold on to it. Okay, mm -hmm. and working with firefighters is that you will lean on any equipment you have that you can lean. You will hold on to the banister as you're going upstairs. And the reason is because if your diaphragm is supposed to be helping you with balance, mm. is that what does it defer to? If you have to breathe or if you have to balance, which one is it gonna take first? Breathing, which means your balance is at risk. Mm. So having a strong diaphragm and breathing diaphragmatically is terrifically important for your balance and for your stability. What about when it comes to something like a lifting belt? Um, mm -hmm. How should we be utilizing those? Um, and then also, are there belts that can help cue us to breathe mm. properly or are you not a fan of that kind of stuff? So the belt and lifting, again, uh, that's one of those things that I would probably defer to and call you because <laughs> that's a, your yeah. expertise. Um, what... I have found if someone relies and has been using a belt for a long time is that their exhale is horrible, okay? Because you inhale into the belt, which is fine, but then your exhale isn't actually bringing your belly away from the belt because you don't ever want to bring it away from the belt. You want to use the belt. Mm -hmm. So if I work with someone who has been using a belt for a long time, I'm focusing on their exhale because their exhale is really shitty. Yeah. And as far as the, the belts that cue... Um, the 360 belt by um, a physical therapist I love. 
uh, named Erin Reguire is the one I like um, because it has cue points on it where you can actually feel your body moving into it. Oh, so that's cool. the one that I like. Um, Would people wear that during like an activity or mainly just for standing, walking kind of thing? You know what? I think you can use it, you know, for all kinds of like different things. Like if you're things. running, maybe you could wear it and like just get a little cue or maybe it would be too cumbersome or something. Again, I think there's individual differences mm -hmm. and, and whatever, I'm big on whatever works for you. I use that belt to help people understand a back breath or a lateral breath. Again, we have so much uh, misunderstanding and, and so many beautiful confusing cues around breathing mm -hmm. that the more practical and and simple and kinesthetic we can get um, hearing the breath. So when I was working with you guys, I want to hear the breath. I want you to put your hands on your body is that we need to actually bring everything down to be as tactile and kinesthetic as possible when it comes to breathing because otherwise we go back to this romantic or, you know, version of the breath, which is beautiful or one that's, you know, mechanically unsound. What about the way that a baby breathes? I heard people refer to that. And I think most people can kind of visualize like a, a toddler when they're breathing. They just sit there and they kind of naturally let their belly be distended and they, yeah. don't, they don't have any of the thoughts that we have. <laughs> and then also I've heard people talk about like an alligator breath. Um, before and I, I don't know if you think that's a good cue or if that's poor or what your stance yeah. is on it. So the ba I never use the baby breath because toddlers don't. I mean, babies, infants don't have a choice. You know, they can't actually breathe uh, vertically. They can't breathe apically. So when it gets interesting is when kids have a choice, what happens? Mm. And that when we have a choice and we start being able to manipulate the breath is when we screw it up, right? So. Baby breathing, it's good because you can look at your kid breathe, but I don't use it as an example. I'll say, look at a toddler, look at a three-year-old, look at a four-year-old. Five-year-old things get a little sticky because the breath changes between the ages of five and six. Mm -hmm. I did the study looking at that. Um, by six, you have kids that are predominantly vertical breathers because they're looking at their parents, because mm -hmm. they're sitting in school, because they're starting to be tested and be social animals. So the breath changes at that age. And yeah. if you're a parent, is that please, please keep your kid at least being able to understand what a horizontal belly diaphragmatic breath is. Even if they have to use the vertical breath for whatever, of, you know, whenever they want to, mm -hmm. they need to not lose the understanding of, of the belly the diaphragmatic breath. So I don't say baby um, uh, for that reason, but I do ask people to look at their pets because we are the mm. only dumb animals on the planet <laughs> that have taken a beautiful, perfect breath and made it completely dysfunctional, yeah. anatomically incongruous. We were not designed to be breathing vertically all the time as a primary way of getting air in and out of our bodies. So I do say, look at your dog, Look at your cat, look at your fish, look at any animal you have around you, mm -hmm. um, and you will see them breathing diaphragmatically. Even those, I always have somebody say, what about kangaroos? <laughs> you know, Because they're upright. Like, no, kangaroos are not vertical breathers. They're still diaphragmatic breathers. They're still going to inhale and expand and exhale and narrow. Yeah. So I don't use babies. I use animals usually. Ooh, that sounded awful. Okay. <laughs> um, alligator. So... Um, the alligators, it's interesting because they don't, again, I love the verbal cues, is that um, you have to pick your words so carefully when you describe something where there's so much misinformation. And and even, you know, looking at Chris breathe yesterday, this was fascinating, is that he was having a hard time taking a belly breath and then exhaling. More is more his exhale because, again— he lifts. Um, but as soon as he was talking about getting under the bar and, and he got under this, you know, this fake bar, all of a sudden he tipped his hips and took a big, beautiful, horizontal breath. Mm -hmm. So you every time you have a new person in front of you, and this is how I teach my teachers, is that you have to figure out what are the words that work for them. What has their experience with breathing been? And what's the cue that makes them go, oh, man. So when I have someone and they say to me, God, I feel like I know this already. I'm like, bingo. That's intuitive. That means it feels right to you. And that's what I want. Because you're designed to breathe this way and you used to breathe this way. So I'm just reteaching you something that, you know, 
you should know, that it should feel somewhat familiar, hopefully soon. But you wouldn't believe how many pulmonologists I have taking my course because they say, I know about lungs, but I don't know how to teach someone the mechanics of how to breathe, or I don't know how to get someone who is, for instance, a paradoxical breather, a reverse breather, to be uh, diaphragmatic. Mm. So it's always astounding to me when I have someone who's a pulmonologist who comes in. Um, alligator. When you think of alligator, you think lean, right? You don't think of a belly breath when you think of an alligator, so I don't use that. Alligator is, you know, if you don't know, is that you take the breath and your belly down. And what you're supposed to be feeling mm. is on the inhale, you're supposed to push the floor away. And on the exhale, you're supposed to flatten. Um, however, your shoulders can still move. Mm. And I don't love to teach breathing completely um, on a horizontal plane all the time, uh, prone or supine, because what happens? You stand up. And all of a sudden, your perspective is different. You lose it. And that's why when you get adjusted, uh, you go to chiropractor, physical therapist, whatever, everything's done this way. And you're like, okay, great. I can breathe diaphragmatically, belly breathe, great. You turn this way, you're back to breathing vertically. Mm. So that's why you have to learn the breathing in all different positions. I love cat-cow the best. So if you're going to do a movement with breathing, cow is the inhale cat is the exhale and that gets your hips moving in the right direction and it gets you understanding oh well this is also rock and roll inhale belly middle of the body opens exhale it squeezes but yeah my my mentor louis simmons he taught me how to utilize the belt he would talk about breaking the belt uh filling a, your stomach up with as much air as possible to and he also taught like to keep their belt not super tight. He was a big proponent of that. I know some people like to really latch those things down and they have their their own things that work for them, but that's kind of the way that I was taught. And I was also taught to do exercises with the belt on. So uh not, and not just a squat and not just a deadlift, but um abdominal exercises. Mm -hmm. And those exercises were done standing up and uh, oblique exercises. And uh, Louis, at the time, I was uh, I was only like 210 pounds or 215 pounds. And I, it was really hard for me to figure out how to like blow my stomach up. And uh, he was always like, you're not going to ever squat anything, like moving <laughs> your stomach like that. Like this is, he would just shake his head and like walk away. Like, this is horrible. But uh, he really did... Um, he really did uh, hammer that home. Like mm -hmm. you need to be able to flex your obliques. And he was like, the belt is not necessarily for your back. He's like, it's actually more to activate. Mm -hmm. Think about it more as an activating brace for like your stomach. And then you can brace the whole body better because you have it on. He's like, so it's, it's just a piece of material that you're putting on that is uh, assisting your body in doing what it can already do. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. But it made it work a lot better for me. See, that's why I would have called you for the for the, the belt <laughs> answer because, yeah. Um, um, it's interesting when I talk about cues and, and again, about valsalfa and, and intra-abdominal, intra-thoracic um, pressure is that the cue of exhaling against a closed glottis is not the best. And we've been using that forever with valsalva, but it makes you focus on exhaling against this part of your body. And what you're wanting to do is brace your middle so that i don't love that cue for that reason for mm -hmm. those words um and you really don't want to be messing um pushing too much against this part of your body and your neck mm. and your face and that's when you get that feeling in your face <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah people like yeah. blow their all their yeah. all the capillaries out of yeah. their face from doing yep. squat or deadlift yeah. lose your mud right yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we were talking about um like Chris, it made me think about like pain in general is an interesting thing when it comes to breathing. Because when I think about the times that I've had like recent injuries and past injuries, when I pay attention to how my, where my breathing starts to go without me realizing it, it starts to become very shallow and it starts to kind of come up top. And then I have to remind myself, whoa, 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 longer breaths, take that mm -hmm. to the diaphragm. It's like when you're in pain, it's almost like you want to. Oh yeah, you want to tighten up. So different, especially like getting up or trying to get out of the car carefully. You're like, eh, uh, uh, like in your, <laughs> and it all seems to a lot of yeah. Mm -hmm. You're 
just trying to be as rigid as possible. Well, and, exactly. and then sometimes, like for me, if I take a deep breath, like it makes it worse. Right? That's like then, I have to like, <laughs> and then like, and then try to get up and move where you know wherever I'm stuck. Exactly. But I found that like for example, with the recent thing that happened with my scap when everything crunched in mm. and I was I was it was messed up for a little bit. I was like, okay, I, I found that I was actually able to handle it better mm -hmm. when I was just folk, like when I shifted and like, okay, take a deep breath, breathe through your diaphragm. I was able to handle that pain better and I was able to do more because I was more relaxed. So then it makes me wonder, well, if some people already have dysfunctional breathing and then they get injured and then their breathing starts to become more dysfunctional because of the pain, it could end up being a continuous cycle because now that injury is harder to recover. Their breathing's fucked. Maybe they get to train through it, but something else happens. Breathing becomes more fucked. And it's, it, it, it seems really just messed up. So I'm wondering how can somebody pull themselves out of that cycle of dysfunctional breathing and pain? Because it seems that that tends to sooner or later just meld together. Absolutely. And there is, there's places where there's not a lot of research when it comes to breathing and there's places where there's tons. There's a lot of research that shows that dysfunctional breathing and a lower pain threshold go together, period. Uh. Okay. So not only does your breathing become more dysfunctional, the pain becomes more acute and more chronic. And think about it. When you're in pain, you try not to move. You said this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that that's the natural reaction when it's acute, all right. Now, what happens if it's chronic and you try not to move? Now you tighten up, right? And the pain gets worse or it doesn't go away. So you have to break that cycle by actually taking an inhale, relaxing your body, you know, knowing you're not going to hurt when you take that inhale, relaxing it, and then exhaling well. So there's a great book by John Sarno uh, called The Mind Body Prescription. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was actually another book that, that really pushed me in this direction. And he talked a lot about back pain um, and breathing. So he would treat, he was a back surgeon that stopped doing surgery and started teaching breathing and doing therapy. Mm -hmm. So I was like, huh, well, I do therapy. I'm starting to learn how to teach breathing. This is exactly what I want to do. So you wouldn't believe how many people that have chronic pain, once you get their breathing to be diaphragmatic it can't be just like a big breath it actually has to be diaphragmatic so you have to do the breathing iq or something called the marm uh, which is dr rosanna uh, rosalba courtney out of sydney does or a diaphragm ultrasound um, once you get breathing to be diaphragmatic it just ripples throughout your whole body so your diaphragm you know along the same lines is your main muscle of detoxification if you're not breathing diaphragmatically, you're not getting lymph, lactate, adrenaline, you know, the toxins your body has out of your body efficiently. So it's getting that diaphragm to be able to do what it's supposed to do. Can you explain that a little more? Because sure. I think when some people hear toxins, they're automatically just shut off. They're like, yeah. bullshit. Yeah. So can you explain like what- <laughs> Detoxify. Like, exactly. <laughs> can you explain exactly what you mean though when yeah. breathing through the diaphragm, how that can actually help? Sure. I mean, you think about um, a, a body or a, a anything where you are pulsating. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, you're going to be able to squeeze things out and mm -hmm. get movement in your body. And in general, you know, our circulation and lymph, if you're rigid and you're not moving, whether it's because of uh, the myths you think about posture or because of weight or because you're not healthy, is that it takes you longer to detoxify. So it takes longer to get lactate out of your body. Mm -hmm, and there mm -hmm. are studies that show that if you breathe diaphragmatically, you're going to get lactate out of your body faster. Yeah. Great. You're also going to have a uh, cerebral spinal fluid, which is that flush through your brain, happen more regularly. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're also going to um, have more regular bowel movements. I'm so, going to say yeah. it's interesting because the body's always, you know, seeking to take stuff in. Yeah. And it's also seeking to like get rid of stuff yeah. that's not valuable to it, right? And we do very badly with the getting stuff out. We do really well with putting things in. <laughs> but the but getting them out, <laughs> not so much. And, you know, I, um, I worked in the prison system for a while. And when I would, when I would see someone, I would ask two questions. Um, I would ask lots of questions. But the first two were, um, when's the last time you cried and why? Mm. And the second one was, how often do you have, do you poop? Do you have a bowel movement? 
And because one would tell me about their emotional health and one would give me a lot of information in just one question about their physical health. So those were two. And I always had the guys be, and it was mostly men, uh, because it was out of the Brooklyn DA. It was the men's program. Is uh, They'd be surprised at those two questions. They're like, I cried yesterday and I poop at 8 o'clock every morning. You're, like, You're free to go. <laughs> You're free to go. You're yeah. good. You shouldn't be in jail. What are yeah. you doing here? <laughs> Damn. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, Dr. Sarno, um, he was on to some really cool shit. I was reading um, just healing back pain mm. on, on the mental side of things. Mm-hmm. I thought that shit was uh, pretty powerful, uh, especially for me, just because I've been dealing with this for a long time. Yep. Do you ever work on like, I know you just said you asked those two questions, but do you ever like start out with a questionnaire and kind of get to the mental side of things? All the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, when I, I said I teach teachers is that you have to have skills to be able to do a good clinical interview. If somebody comes in and they don't breathe well or they're like they're upset about their breathing. So most people will come in and, you know, they either say I've been diagnosed with asthma mm-hmm. or um, I had COVID or I want to be not be so breathless during my sport. Um, or there's, they say, you know, I'm, I'm anxious and my doctor said I need to work on my breathing. Yeah. So you have the reason people come in, but there's always another reason. There's always something else. So it's really wonderful because you all have folks that won't go to a therapist or won't address their mental health, but they will come in and talk about breathing, which always leads to mental health as well because the two are so intimately con- uh, connected. So you have to ask about, you know, when did this, when did this start? And sometimes, you know, I'm thinking about a woman I had come in and um, she was a breath holder. Okay. Um, fine. We write it down. We go around in circles, talk, you know, blah, blah, blah. And finally I say, you know, why don't I just ask her? I said, when did you start doing this? And she said, oh, um, my child was abducted six cool. years ago. Okay. It turned out okay. It turned out okay. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. she knew exactly when it started but we have to ask questions. So I said, she knew exactly when she started and she's like, I got my baby back, it was okay, everything's fine. Yeah, I know. Um, But I still, it's a stress response and I still do it. But knowing that made me change how I was gonna deal with her because she needed to actually come to some peace uh, before she was able to stop holding her breath intermittently throughout the day Mm. to really, really get her heart to understand that like, it's okay, this won't happen again. We did the right thing, everything's okay now. So you have to bring in the psychological, and it may be something as easy as, you know, why why are you sucking in your gut all the time? I used to be chubby when I was a kid. It may just be that simple. Yeah. Yeah. The breath holding thing's really interesting because um, it's something that you see a lot in new, even actually you'll see it in some upper belts who haven't really dealt with it, but in jujitsu with new people, because it's, uh, if you've never been body to body with somebody like that, and now they're on top of you and they're getting ready to choke you out and you have to use, you have to use force. So many times I have to remind white belts, I have to stop and be like, breathe, <laughs> yeah. start breathing. Yeah. Because it, when trying to produce force on somebody, they're like, you get nervous and stuff too. Like there's nerves of like rolling and there's other people watching, right? But then yeah. you guys also do mean, evil shit to each other where you put your mm-hmm. knees in certain spots mm-hmm. and you're on belly. Mm-hmm. Like you're so right? strong and probably good at that where almost anybody's going to be like, eh, like <laughs> I don't do that shit to white belts. I mean, come no, on. No, no, I know. I know. I know. I know. But, the, but that's the thing. It's like, it, I think jujitsu is kind of interesting in that sense because when you see an individual progress from white belt to blue belt, it's like you'll start, you'll roll with them again, and wow, they're breathing better. It's like it, it's almost like a crash it course on breathing because you can't develop in jujitsu if you're holding your breath continuously. You'll gas out too much. You won't be able to practice. You'll injure yourself. You're fucked. It's a big part of the game, right? It's, it's to kind of ma- manipulate, uh, manipulate the way the other guy feels so you can get him into other positions, right? In mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of ways, right? You yeah. stack the guy up. That makes it hard to breathe. Inverting, uh, yeah. You were talking about breathing and inverting. All yesterday. the different movements, right? Yeah. So it's it's somewhat interesting because I think like you can develop with dysfunctional breathing through jujitsu. I've definitely seen that, but many people do have a benefit on being able to breathe better under stress as they progress through that martial art, just because of the nature of having to breathe through stress. And again, jujitsu is is fascinating in that reason. I grew up watching a lot of wrestling, mm. so. Um, you know, my high school was a big wrestling and football uh, and cross country, which I was on. But um, so I, I love watching wrestling. I'm, it's just I'm weirdly 
really happy watching. She went to the school that beat my school when I was a senior in the playoffs. Oh shit! Really? <laughs> she went to yeah North Rockland High so, School. Yeah. So they your school paid refs is what she's <laughs> <you're> saying. <laughs> no, we had uh, our defensive back was yeah. so slow, and I was always so pissed that he was back there, <sighs> and I knew he was right. gonna fucking blow it at one point, and he did. He got smoked. <laughs> And we lost seven to nothing. You still uh, remember the Santos. He remembers. I He's punch still him right bitter. in the face. <laughs> Isn't it funny how we remember the names? Like, I can't remember my pin I or my to password. I tell the coach to all the time, like, I'm so much faster than he is. Why is he back there? He's horrible. He's going to get smoked. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. He was Never horrible. Forget. Yeah. But you're, you're saying um, <laughs> about jujitsu? <laughs> oh, jujitsu. So when I first started teaching, uh, I thought it was like yogis that were going to call me, right? Mm -hmm. I thought it was yogis. I'm like, okay, fine. Like, you know, the yoga community, they love breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and the yoga community didn't want anything to do with me. I literally have never taught yogis <laughs> now that I think about it. So I sort of said, okay, well, I'll teach anybody who listens. This is how you feel when you <laughs> start doing this. Yeah. And and you should be open-minded. When I talk to my teachers, it's like, don't come in with a plan. Come in being as open-minded as possible because people will come to you and you just have to be ready for a group of people that you might not have thought of in the past. So I get a call and it is um, Steve Cardian, who is a black belt in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, and he actually opened the first Gracie Jiu-Jitsu jiu-jitsu gym on the east coast mm. um he's a fantastic person um wrote a book called uh um about your superpower about women's intuition and uh self-protection yeah. so steve uh calls me and he has me come into his gym and teach so jiu-jitsu and then i get called by the dea in new york so the first two groups of people were jiu-jitsu and uh law enforcement wow yeah Super and cool. and it was great because then I could talk about breathing and arousal. So mm -hmm. not just endurance and gas, which is, you know, jujitsu always wants to know about gas, yeah. but also uh, arousal, which is super important, especially in a tactical and a combat sport. Yeah. What about things like myofascial release? Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, we're talking a lot about breathing um, and breathing seems to be able to help a lot of things. Uh, but I'm imagining there's things that can assist your breathing. So like if something's tight, something's, uh, you know, you, you were kind of doing a little bit of it to us uh, yesterday because we were doing these certain movements and then you would come over and uh, kind of scrape on some of those areas. What are some of your thoughts on that and how does that uh, impact our breathing? Mm, so much. So I work with um, an organization called Leadership Under Fire. Um, and uh, we work with different fire departments and, and first responders, anybody who's in a volatile, sort of fast-changing environment when it comes to their careers. Um, one of the people that took my class probably like 15 years ago is a guy named Jimmy Lopez. And Jimmy Lopez is a special operations firefighter in New York City, um, and he owns a gym in uh, Staten Island. Jimmy, super quiet during class, super quiet during class, listening, listening, listening. And then I find out who he is and what he does. Intense human being, intense, incredible human being, right? Um, he's in his mid-50s. He is so in shape. He is so flexible. Hmm. Um, just fantastic human being. So, of course, I scoop him up, get him to teach for me. Um, and we actually work together and we work to go to different fire departments and, and talk to people. And Jimmy talks about movement and breathing um, and strength but he actually focuses on fascia. And he's a big fan of, of Jill Miller and Tom Myers, uh. but it's great to bring in Jimmy, who um, people always say, we went to Canada and actually taught some firefighters there, is that they wanted subtitles, because he's from Staten Island, and <laughs> you know the accent's really heavy, but it's fantastic, because he's talking about fascia and all these like really interesting, very uh, progressive things mm -hmm. to a group of people that in general, um, can be pretty close-minded and traditional, okay? I don't say that um, in an insulting way at all. It's just fire departments in general. Um, it's it's a very closed group of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, understandably so, because folks want to look at them like lab rats. It's like, here we have people who run into fires rather mm. than run away from fires. So um, sheepdog is what they, sheepdogs is what they call them. Um, and uh, anyway, so Jimmy actually addresses fascia um, in, in detail. He's my go-to for fascia, and he will 
talk to groups of people and he brings in an orange and he peels the orange and he shows you like that netting on the yeah, orange and he yeah. like this is mm. what it looks like and example. talks about hydration and especially with sports where there's so much injury so for instance with with firefighters is that you have uneven weight on you like it's different when you have even weight okay i can do that but all of a sudden the weight's uneven and the amount of equipment that you now have to carry it's gotten more and more you know, progressively. So now it's 80, 100 pounds. So if you work in structural fires and you have to go up 10, 20, 30 flights of stairs carrying 100 pounds, like that's, it's really tough on your body. And then, you know, get into a room that's 600 degrees. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really tough on your body. But um, again, not my area of specialization, um, although I have somebody who talks about it um, in my classes. And I know that Jill Miller, who's a big Fascia person, is coming out with a book called, um, I think it's called Breathing in Bliss. Mm. I think so. I got to check on that. But she yeah, I is- I think Jill makes that that ball that everyone always looks at. Yeah. And I'm like, what does that thing do? Because yeah. it, it's a- it's really soft. It's yeah. actually super squishy. But when yeah. you lay on it, actually, like especially if you have uh, some adhesions through your stomach, you're like, oh, my God, this thing yeah. looks great. So that's the um, – it's called the gorgeous ball. And I always get in trouble because I want to call it the courageous ball. <laughs> so she always yells at me. But um, the gorgeous ball I use for people that need help exhaling. So I have them lean on it to push their ribs into their body so they can feel what an exhale should, mm. should feel like. So I do love those balls, yeah. Yeah, mm. things great. I, you know, quick question about breathing through the back when we were talking about that. Because when we were when we were talking, I was just like messing around and seeing how that feels. Um, obviously, in jujitsu with neon belly, that's kind of what ends up happening when somebody has their pressure of their knee mm -hmm. on your stomach. You then, when you breathe, your breathing kinda goes through in a bit. And yeah, you kind of crunch in. Your breathing kind of goes through this area. But if you were to stand here, keep your hand on your stomach so you make sure that doesn't protrude and you don't want this to come up, mm -hmm. and you just focus on. Like, it's weird because when you breathe into your back, it's like your stomach actually starts to come in, right? Whereas usually when we inhale, mm -hmm. but when you breathe through your back, it's yeah. like this comes in and then this starts to protrude. What? Um, yeah. Well, your stomach will go like in and out, right? Like when you take a real, start to get into like a real deep breath. Well, you should be able to breathe. Again, the breath you want. I say belly breath because it resonates with people and yeah. it gets them out of a vertical breath. Mm -hmm. Okay. You need to do things in steps. But once they understand that, I want you breathing 360 degrees. Yeah. I want you to be able to breathe forward if you need to, to the side if you want, in back, you know, maybe sometimes when you're breathing all the way around, you don't see any movement in the body yeah. when you're good at that, but mm -hmm. your breathing IQ is really great. So um, the you should be able to expand this way, but you also want to be able to do this way. So mm -hmm. your your belly might stay tight, but your back opens up, or both of them may be able to go like this. And again, remember, again, in your mind's eye, I want you to think about the diaphragm, and you know I use the, the colander, the steamer, is that it descends, it flattens, and it pushes the ribs open mm. all the way around. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What are like, what do you think would be like three things that somebody's listening to this could do um, if they're like going on a walk or just trying to practice some of the stuff that we're talking about here today could... Somebody potentially, uh, like a weight vest might be a horrible idea, but I'm just thinking like, can somebody put some weight on themselves or can somebody like farmers walk? Because sometimes the, the sometimes the weight gives you like some feedback. I'm not talking about like hold 100 pounds in each hand or anything, something light. Are, are there some easy practices that people can employ to get them to breathe just a little bit better in general? So you just mentioned two things that I don't, it's not like sort of my first line of, of mm -hmm. uh, but that's actually great is that if you have a weight vest um, and I'm not, uh, you know, vests, bulletproof vests and, and vests in, for law enforcement actually can really hurt your breath because they have to be tight if you're going to mm -hmm. run. Mm -hmm. But if you have a vest of some sort where you can have it be loose and then you inhale and you feel yourself fill into it without moving your shoulders and then exhale, come away from it. That's a great cue. Um, the other thing is I do have people do lighter farmer carries because I don't want them to pick up their shoulders. So I say mm -hmm. breathe and don't pick up your shoulders. Um, but along with that, you have to say tip your hips. And again, you don't want to do this with a lot of weight, obviously. Um, one of – it's a little advanced, but one of the things I like um, is going upside down. 
So not in a handstand because I want all the weight to be on your shoulders. Um, you can do this putting two uh, two boxes together. Mm. Um, there's a gadget called the feet up, which I really like. You put it up against the wall. If you don't want to buy that, I always give people um, you know suggestions that they can also do their own thing is that two boxes of paper, um, you can put those against the wall. Then you flip upside down with your shoulders. You, you open the boxes up. You put your head in between. And it's called an assisted mm. headstand. It's still on my Instagram store if you want to yeah? pull up how oh, she yeah. had it set up. I just found that. Oh, oh there we go. That. Oh, yeah. that's not crazy expensive. That's, a, that's So it's a, it's a sweet tool. little thing. You can have it in your living room without feeling like it's ugly. But again, I always like saying if you don't want to buy a thing, <laughs> mm -hmm. is that, oh, look at that one. That one's kind of iffy, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. Fancy. Oh, fancy. <laughs> Yeah, is that, that you yeah. don't have it in the middle of the room because I don't want you balancing, <laughs> okay? Mm. This is you breathing and not being able to move your shoulders mm. because we haven't experienced that. Some of us haven't experienced not taking a breath using our auxiliary muscles in decades. So now you get to see what it feels like. Oh, there we go. There you go, upside yeah, down. Yeah, upside yeah. down. We use two boxes for that. But yeah, not yeah. breathing with your auxiliary muscles. Yeah. So you get to feel what it's like being able to breathe without them. Mm -hmm. um, because in general, we need those examples to be able to then translate them into our regular breath. So the upside down is really, really great. And then my number one recommendation is to get your breathing IQ. Go to thebreathingiq.com. Have a soft measuring tape if you can find one. If not, you can use a, a, one of those metal ones. But know what your grade is because too often it's, you know, you don't have a reference point. And I say this, you can't change what you don't measure. Mm. So we need numbers. And again, you guys love numbers too. I love knowing how many plates, um, mm. how many more, how many less. Is like give me a number that I can beat. Um, or try to get close to, that actually motivates me. And that's why I developed the breathing IQ so that you could actually have a number and now you could say, oh, well, I have to go up on my inhale or I have to actually get my exhale to be better. Or now I'm a hybrid. I actually have to get to be a horizontal breather. Mm. Yeah. What about um, people that have uh, like a deviated septum mm -hmm. or some people that may have uh We've had other people on the show. We've had dentists on the show talk mm -hmm. about mouth formation, and yeah. we went way down that rabbit hole. And there's things like mewing, and there's <laughs> chewing on hard gum, and there's like lots of things yeah. that you can do. Um, but what about somebody who just has uh, some some issues with maybe their nose? Uh, some people will sometimes mention to us that they have really bad allergies and things of that nature. So how do you sure. assist some of those people? You know, uh, and it's because I work with combat and tactical sports is that I'm usually working with someone who has some kind of a crushed nose mm -hmm. at some point. So there's so many people right now that are hearing, breathe through your nose, breathe through your nose. And you're like, I can't. So like, there's <laughs> yeah. no way. And I actually will look at folks and to see like which nostril dominant they are. Mm -hmm. Is that if, if you broke your nose, it was broken for you. Is that which nostril has it left you breathing through? And there's a lot of great information on which nostril and what part of your brain it goes to and so on and so forth. Wow. But is that you have to consider that you might have someone who can't breathe through their nose because of the deviated septum. So um, – if you continue to fight, you may not want to get that fixed because it may get rebroken, mm. right? So you have all that to consider. Um, what I will say is that um, I like, and this this is a product that, again, I don't get endorsed. I don't make anything from. Um, I don't do that. I just, uh, in general, I try to just recommend things I like. Yeah. Um, so the mute nasal expanders, I really like, and they're two little pieces of plastic and they go inside your nose and they, they actually force your nostrils open. It feels kind of great. All right. Um, mm. The neti pot, really mm -hmm. good. Clean out your nose. Is that, and again, when you first do it, it feels a little uncomfortable. Oh, there we go. Nice. Oh, those are cute. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you shove them in there, they open up your nostrils, and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I can breathe. Wow. Um, mm. The neti pot is that little pot. It looks like a little pot. It's nasal irrigation. Mm -hmm. um, and with allergies, what we've found is that if you force yourself to breathe through your nose, um, you will have... I want, I'm going to say it really simply is you will have less allergies is you'll be able to breathe through your nose the more you force yourself to breathe through your nose. And it might be hard to practice it, but if you do it over yeah. time, you'll get better at it. Yeah. And again, having 
something that helps open up your nasal cavities, having tape like you guys use to close your mouth. Like, let's start with just that at night. Mm -hmm. Um, Then during the day, I mean, we have to talk and it's hard to breathe through your nose and talk, but let's just fix our breathing at night. Um, With, uh, there's one topic I'd like to talk about. And I know that Nestor, he's a colleague, talks about that as well, is um, getting your turbinates reduced. Turbinates? Turbinates uh, inside your nose. So getting that reduction because you have oh, allergies, okay. please think about that. It's something that doctors, um, not all doctors, but most doctors, will recommend immediately is having a reduction of those. It can go wrong and you end up with something called, um, I think it's empty head syndrome, okay? And I, I, I am on several um, chats about this because it's important to me, mm-hmm. is that when they take too much out, you can't put it back in again. And if you've had too much taken out, you have this constant feeling of there being air mm-hmm. inside your head. Um, so you feel like this isn't, this isn't there? You just feel like there's this vacuum of nothing inside your head. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit, that's that's horrible. Yeah, horrible. And the rate of suicide is very high. Holy fuck. Yeah, yeah. So please, like, if you have allergies, do everything you can do before getting that surgery. Mm. If you decide to get it, if you get it, go for, like, as as small an amount as possible. Be as conservative as possible Mm -hmm. um, because that's something that uh, that could go wrong. And, you know, with surgeries, they say one out of five surgeries, something goes wrong. But this one is so serious. And I've been on chat boards where all of someone disappears and it's it's Mm. pretty tragic. So, um, yeah, long winded answer about noses. (laughs) Why is uh, tape in the mouth shut important at night for some people or, or just breathing in and out of the nose? I mean, we have so much, there's so many people that talk about that and and I just go by the research and by what they said is we're supposed to breathe through the nose. Um, it is cleaner air. Um, it's, you know, your nitric oxide, mm-hmm. so people bring that up. Um, you tend to breathe slightly more slowly, perhaps if you're breathing through your nose. Um, so if you're breathing through your mouth, also you tend to have your head uh, in more of a forward head posture if you breathe mm. with with your mouth because your chin is forward and the weight of your head varies. Um, and at night you might have obstructed breathing. You might have some signs of some apnea or yes. something snoring. like that. Snoring, yeah. So snoring, it's funny because we make fun of snoring. Like, oh, they snored like a yeah. truck driver or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it truck driver? Train. Anyway, it's like <laughs> that is air not being able to get in and out of your body. Like it's super serious. I have somebody I'm working with right now and he, we it's figured a medical, it out. It's interesting because it's a medical condition and it's like yeah. the one that like people get to make fun of someone about. Yeah. And it's like, it's not really not cool. Yeah. <laughs> It's like really, the guy has got a medical issue going on here. Yeah, and the fatigue. So there's actually an app, and I don't know the name of it offhand because we I just started using it with this particular patient, is that he puts it on at night, and it will tell him the next day about you'll be able to see when you were snoring because he doesn't mm. think he snores. I have that. I had yeah. that up when I was younger. Yeah. I was like, yeah, you see, I downloaded yeah. it, and it records when you're snoring, and you can hear it. Yeah. Yeah, it's And wild. if you talk, it records too. Mm-hmm. It's kind of scary. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, because if somebody else is talking and you're alone, <laughs> That's when it's pretty scary. Oh, yeah. That's a whole nother. <laughs> That's the, whole the <laughs> main reason why I did not get that app because I have a, well, I had a snoring problem and I heard about the app and I'm like, no, I'm too scared to go back and listen. You <laughs> hear another voice? Like, yeah. Fuck, I was exactly. alone. Fuck that. Can you no, I'm good. Oh, man. <laughs> Should have ta- shouldn't have taken that Ambien and gone out <laughs> roller skating. Uh, so um, I don't even know where we're going Sorry. with that. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Snoring, you, you have yeah. a client that was recording yeah. it. So first record yourself, find out how badly you're snoring. Mm. And most people are, are surprised that they're snoring that much. Um, and if you are snoring enough to wake yourself up, it means you're having interrupted sleep, mm. which means you're probably walking around s- uh, sleep deprived and really grouchy. So it's important, like whether you start with a CPAP or... Um, or start looking at to see what's going on with the inside of your mouth and your throat, maybe your weight. I've had people change their breathing, their breathing mechanics, and do my breathing exercises, and their sleep apnea get better. I'm not sure why. 
I mean, I'm saying that I don't promote myself as a um, solution for sleep apnea, but I have had people say, um, I've changed my breathing. I've changed the mechanics. My Because of changing my mechanics, my biochemistry has also gotten better, which is what happens. Um, and now that my daytime breathing is better, my nighttime breathing is better. So, But it makes sense because if you're not, if all of this is, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not as yeah. prominent when you breathe. Yeah. Over, and it's something that I would assume takes a lot of time to change. Yeah. But you could see how some people could potentially reverse their sleep apnea. It's not a quick fix like yeah. an, a machine is, yeah. but if you change the way, you could just reverse it. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, in this journey of, of being a teacher mm -hmm. is that I'm always surprised. And it's wild because I just never know what kind of problem somebody's going to come to me with. Mm. And then I have to figure it out. And it's the figuring it out that's fascinating. And that's why working with spinal cord injury is actually something I really love doing as well is that depending on where you have, and, and, and right now we have we have a lot of people who um, are adaptive athletes and have spinal cord injuries, you know, because we've been at war for 17 years. So how are you breathing if you're in a wheelchair? How are you, you know, are you breathing vertically? Mm. Can you breathe horizontally? Where is your injury? What can we do about it? Yeah. It gets really, it gets really cool. What about uh, people just uh, also learning to reinterpret stuff so that, stuff in general just isn't as stressful. So like, mm. it's a great idea to, you know, breathe and to breathe through all this stuff. I kind of have uh, three rules for myself in terms of like uh, pain or bad news. Uh, I'm allowed to breathe through it. Uh, I'm allowed to laugh about it. And I'm allowed to uh, be stoic about it. Those are kind of like the three, I'm not trying to stuff things yeah. down. I just, those are just fun rules. And, and of course, if I need to be sad for something, then I, I will allow all those things. But uh, what about people just kind of reinterpreting stuff, especially because of your background? So, you know, I think you need to run for president. I think that Mark for president is, is would be a great T-shirt. I'm going to buy that T-shirt when I leave. Um, is that that's a beautiful, beautiful way to look at things. And one of the things, the the active meditation that that we did yesterday and that I that I oh, teach yeah, people, that was great. yeah, wow. is that um, and I teach it more for muscle strength and recovery than necessarily trance. But it also puts you in the trance, which is kind of nice. It gives you perspective. So when I ask you to look out into the distance as if you were looking at a beautiful dark night sky, is that I want you to realize that we are really tiny little specks, right? So I'm, I'm a big fan of that book, Horton Hears a Who. If you haven't read it, like you best, need to go get it. Yeah, best yeah. movie ever, too. Oh, <laughs> it's a good movie. Yeah. I don't know about it. I feel I left out. What oh, is this thing? It's because you're 29. Yeah. Damn it. Okay. It's good. I'll right. send it. it to you. I'll send it to you. But is that Dr. Seuss? Yeah, there it is. Oh, so great. Is that um, you would actually really like the movie? You would really like it. <laughs> okay, I'll you would really legitimately like it. It's fun. I'll yeah. watch it. It's like on Netflix or something. Like it's it's available. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think it's important to ask yourself: Is this a first world problem? You know, you have so many people that their cappuccino isn't isn't hot enough. They get upset about that. <laughs> so really, like, is this a first world problem? Will this pass? You know, if it will pass, if you can fix it with time or money, um, it's not a problem because there's so many folks that that have problems that there's no solution for. So I'm a big advocate for folks doing volunteer work. So if I have you as a patient or if, I, if I'm a mentor, is that you have to do volunteer work. I don't care what it is, but you have to serve. Like that's the point of being here. Put some time into some other people and some of your problems might uh, absolutely seem less and they also Ridiculous. might start to dissipate because other things or other people might start to help you out with some stuff, right? Exactly. Is get out of your own head because it's crowded in there and go do some volunteer work. And there's so many opportunities. You don't have to sign up. I mean, being a big brother is tough because you have to sign up and I think it's three years you have to commit to. But just, I don't know, go distribute something or other mm -hmm. to people that need that thing. Um, there's a million things you can do. And it just makes you feel good and get yourself out of your head. So the reinterpreting things, like you just said, is massively important. I love that. Okay. You get my vote. <laughs> I'm really curious um, because earlier in the podcast, we talked about, you know, there's strength in your cardiovascular skill. So your heart, right? But then you showed us this O2 trainer. Um, and it's interesting because a few years ago, after I read uh, Patrick's book, I got an O2 trainer. I've lost it. But it, I, you probably know what it was. It was like the, this black thing that was shaped like a, you know what, do you know the brand I'm talking about? It's something where it has a dial. It, mm -hmm. It's yeah. black. It was like a yeah. mask kind yeah. of. Yeah. It wasn't it's, a mask. Oh. It is. You just put your mouth on it. Yeah. 
Uh, do you know? Do you know what it is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I was wondering about this O2 trainer. Like, what does it do? And what, if somebody wants to get this one, cool. But are there other really good options? And what does it do for you, great. particularly? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, you guys, you got the prize for the best questions. I'm sorry. Like, I get so excited when I get good questions. Like, you know, deep, um, skeptical, often <laughs> questions. Like, good. No, that's good. So. Um, this is based on what's called RMT, respiratory muscle training. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, before I go into training your breathing muscles, and again, you know, we've got 10 plus pounds of breathing muscles, is that I've added the mechanics. Because if your mechanics aren't good, you're training the wrong muscles. Okay? So once your mechanics are good, you have a good A breathing IQ, is that if you load the bar, and it actually is loading the bar mm -hmm. when you use a gadget of some sort, um, regardless of what it is. They're all similar in that they all restrict your inhale. Usually it's called an IMT, inspiratory muscle training. So um, if you're using the training mask, if you're using that one that's shaped like this, yeah. there's a whole bunch of them. Um, they're not necessarily one better than the other, but the reason I have chosen to use this one is that um, it feels like a piece of gym equipment, yeah. okay? So, mm. Yeah. All right. So again, I don't make anything from promoting this. My it's mouth's just been on that. The one, mm -hmm. your mouth's been on that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just, letting, just letting you know. <laughs> a big old thing of spit shot out of mine. Yeah. Like, what the hell? yeah. Yeah. Spit happens. I always tell people the spit happens. I was so drooly on mine. <laughs> I was like, what was that? When, I, when I pulled it out, I'm like, the hell, I'm yeah. leaking everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you know, don't, don't share this one. <laughs> yeah. So again, this is one of the ones that's out there. Um, I like it because it's just super sturdy mm -hmm. rubber. It feels like a piece of gym equipment. You don't feel like you're holding an inhaler in your mouth. Um, it's comfortable for your mouth. And you can use it with, you know, if I have someone who is post-COVID and they're trying to strengthen their breathing muscles, which is a very good idea, is that I use an, an, um, a bigger hole, which yeah. just makes it easier. Um, and then it goes all the way to that one, which is pretty hellish. Yeah. Um, mm. It's hard to get there. So I like this one, again, because it's someone in combat sports who devised it, um, someone who actually understands the breathing. Mm -hmm. He has an A breathing IQ. So whenever I have somebody come and bring me a product, I always want to know how much do you understand about the importance of mm. the mechanics. And you wouldn't believe uh, there was one particular um, – there we go. There was one particular gadget that uh, somebody, you know, uh, put me in touch with, and they didn't care about whether the breathing was diaphragmatic or not. Mm. They didn't care about the mechanics or not. They weren't interested in doing either breathing IQ, and I'm like, why am I partnering with you if you don't believe in what I do as well? Mm. Um, with Boss Rutten, not only is he hysterical to hang around with, is that his uh, his breathing IQ is an A, mm -hmm. and he understands the importance of breathing One diaphragmatically. Of most lethal fighters of all time. Oh my dude. god, he was so incredible! I don't know if you know that he's uh, famous for like a kidney punch. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know if you liver. Oh, liver punch. Liver, yeah, liver kill. That's just, yeah, which I think he did it with his palm. Oh, man. He was just like Doesn't I don't even just know. Like knock you out, like you just it like just, you faint. It, people just like, ah, they just yeah, they just like hit the ground. Yeah, it's brutal. So we just uh, – actually, Boss and I just did a video that's going to be out hopefully soon um, called a Breathing for Warriors MMA. So it's mm. a teaching video that actually is for MMA, and that should be out soon. But so muscle training is that uh, most of the research on muscle training, um, Alison McConnell, who's a researcher out of the UK, mm -hmm. somebody else named um, Mitch Lomax and Rachel Vickery, um, all fantastic researchers that have looked at respiratory muscle training and how it affects performance. And it's fantastic, especially in endurance sports. So not necessarily in sprinting, but in endurance sports over and over and over again. You train your breathing muscles, your performance is better. Mm. So I love that because, again, if your diaphragm needs to be strong because you need balance, if your diaphragm needs to be strong in all your muscles because you want to be able to have a faster running time, um, if you want them to be stronger because you want to be able to recover faster, like train your muscles. Train your muscles like you do any other muscle in your body. Would sprinting and uh – Metcons, metabolic conditioning workouts through CrossFit, would those things, uh, and maybe just playing a sport 
at high speed, uh, would those things help train the diaphragm or you think you need like a little more specific? No. And and here's the thing is that you know this, is that if you're going to work out a muscle, you have to work it to exhaustion, Mm -hmm. right? Um, If you're doing your sport, you're not working your breathing muscles to exhaustion. You stop because the rest of your muscles what fail. What about when you're running so hard that you get like a cramp? Like, is that, would that be getting your diaphragm to? No. No. Mm-mm. Not, good, not good enough. <laughs> so what we did yesterday, our workout, mm-hmm. that is getting Got your it. diaphragm okay. trained. And w- was it hard? Uh, yeah, some of the aspects yeah. of it, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So it's not, again, when I say teach breathing. Different though. Yeah. Different, yeah. Different hard because the sense of fatigue is a little confusing. Like you Mm -hmm. feel tired, but you're not feeling the burn that you usually do and you're not moving the rest of your body. So to train your breathing muscles, you have to do it separately from your sport. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really big on cheating too. So I just started cheating so bad. I'm like, I Mm. need to just stop because I'm I'm (laughs) thinking I'm just like doing the exercises incorrectly at this point. I don't know. You're pretty good. You got to 290 yeah, balloon. Yeah. Well, no, exhale pulsations. Yeah. 290 exhale pulsations. That's fantastic. The balloon was kind of funny, like blowing up one I, balloon and then... Letting that one go out. I yeah. couldn't I didn't yeah. bring my clown shoes for that. I was laughing the whole time. <laughs> yeah. I could not blow up a fucking <laughs> balloon. <laughs> I'm yeah. such a child. You <laughs> have to be able to blow up a balloon. Your exhale has to be good. And you know, I, I know we talked about this a little bit, is that given that we are in a respiratory health crisis, right? And, mm-hmm. and COVID maybe... I don't know where we are in COVID today, but is that we are going to have, uh, this respiratory health crisis is going to continue. We're going Mm. to have other viruses. We certainly have wildfires. We have pollution. We have all kinds of things that are going to be affecting our lungs. There's a great book uh, by Dr. Michael Steffen, I think his name is, called Breathtaking, which talks about sort of the history of pulmonary health. And respiratory health is the new cardiac health. So you need to make sure that even if you're not doing a sport, you're taking care of and you're training your lungs and your breathing muscles. Because, for instance, one of the things that can be the difference between you having pneumonia um, and you having bronchitis, bronchitis going to pneumonia and your pneumonia going to death, is that you be able to exhale and cough well. Mm. So, for instance, when I have a, a patient or a client that has Parkinson's, I know that they're not going to die from Parkinson's. They're going to die from pneumonia because they're not able to exhale and cough stuff up in order to be able to breathe That's better. really interesting. I have noticed before that uh, some heavier people, when they cough, they sometimes will end up with almost like a coughing fit, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. just being on an airplane and <clears throat> seeing, you know, observing people uh, at an airport that are heavier or stuff like, stuff mm-hmm. like that. I've just kind of noticed that. So that's interesting. Being able to, I've I've thought about this stuff too, like just with like running and uh, you know sprinting on the bike and mm-hmm. things like that. Sometimes you're going so hard that you you kind of get your throat to that point uh, where you feel like you're gonna like your um, maybe it's the lactic acid yeah. or something like that. You know you uh, your even sometimes your voice changes quite a bit from working out so hard. Yeah, and you get that burn in the back of your throat yeah. that sometimes makes you cough. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, like, coughing in a... Now everybody, you, you get dirty looks, you cough anywhere. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Especially mm-hmm. in an airplane. Especially in an airplane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the weight is interesting. I mean, when you talk about uh, if someone is overweight, they're almost always going to have COPD, mm-hmm. chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. Um, and that is, in some part, self-inflicted. Um, but there you have this spiral of not being able to breathe well, and then having the weight and it affecting your mental health. And again, you're in, you're in that loop. Mm. And I have to tell you what we're talking about today, and uh, Chris brought this up, is that it takes a long time for research to get to the front lines. It does. It, it crawls to the front lines. But because you guys are doing this, it is an incredible service to get research and new ideas to the front lines that wouldn't normally have happened for another decade. Mm. All right. So when I talk about uh, breathing exercises, I look what's happening in respiratory therapy post COVID. And right now what we are doing, what we did yesterday is so far ahead of what's happening in respiratory clinics. And I'm not insulting respiratory physiologists is that their training has not caught up to, for instance, what we're talking about right now. Yeah. You so know, it's pretty crazy. Two interesting, the two, actually, the first question I had was, 
is there like a routine for the way if someone were to get this, mm -hmm. how do they know the frequency and all that to use it? But secondly, what was the forceful exhales we were doing called where we were doing that over and over? What was it called again? Those are exhale pulsations. Exhale pulsations. And just the interesting aspect about doing that is that literally the, the my intercostals and my obliques, those muscles just started to burn. Mm -hmm. Like as we were getting deeper and deeper, it's mm -hmm. like, they they were getting worked in a way that's different from like you know just doing crunches or yeah. something like that so you're literally like i felt those muscles start to burn yeah. so it, I, I get what you're saying yeah. by those being exercises for the muscles for breathing it it's a pretty big deal it makes a big difference yeah and think about so for instance exhale when i first started teaching um you know swat and homeland security didn't want to hear the word kapalabhati mm. right okay i get it is that you want to hear words that kind of make more sense to you. Yeah. So um, I took some of what the breath is in Kapalabhati, which is yoga. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I come from martial arts, sports science, and a little bit of yoga, is that um, the exhale in yoga, that kind of sharp, sharp exhale in yoga philosophy helps disperse irritability. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I do it because I want your exhale to be better. So the reason why I do it is different. Um, so we did, and you did hundreds of them, yeah. right? You did hundreds. Your average person does 50. Your average athlete does 120. Mm -hmm. So you did hundreds. And, and you know, we kind of ran out of time, but I think at some point you should see what your max is. <laughs> yeah, because, I'm going uh, yeah, to I know you are. Out. Not only that, you're going to break it. I, I can <laughs> tell already. Um, but you need, especially, for instance, say you are in a combat sport where you have to strike. Mm. So tell me, why would you being able to do hundreds of exhale pulsations be important if you're in a sport where striking? Well, getting you punched strike. in the body, you're probably going to want to exhale that air. And also, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, awesome. I don't do punching martial arts, but you notice when boxers punch, when they throw punches, it's like <laughs> they, right. they do that a lot. So I don't know if that's what you're talking mm -hmm. about, but. Yeah. So when you strike, you exhale. That's yeah. the normal mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens if your exhale muscles get tired and you're punching? Oh, <sighs> shit. Punching power. All right? Yeah. Yeah. So wow. for me, when I work with someone who strikes, who has a martial art where they strike, mm -hmm. you have to be able to do unlimited amounts of exhale pulsations because maybe your arms give out, maybe your mental game gives out, mm -hmm. maybe your opponent is stronger, but it's not your breathing muscles that are going to get in the way of your strike weakening. Yeah. So super important. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. so, so that makes sense. So with this, like where does somebody find, if they were to get some of this, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's going to be quite a few people that grab the O2 trainer. How does someone use it? So the way a boss uses it is it's 30 reps uh, once a day. And I think he does it every other day. So day. you start with a hole, one of those caps that it feels comfortable, but you have to first make sure your breathing IQ is an A. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just training the wrong muscles. Mm -hmm. Okay. So go to the breathing IQ, get your get your breathing IQ. Um, I'll also send you five those five stretches that we did yeah. to get your breathing IQ to be an A. And then you'll get an annoying newsletter. You can opt out of that. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, once your breathing IQ is an A, then you start using that. And remember that particular trainer and any inspiratory muscle trainer is only for your inhale mm -hmm. okay so it's only your diaphragm so you have to do exhale pulsations or use balloons to be able to get your exhale muscles to be good and just like we did when we were training yesterday is yeah. that we flip back and forth between one and the other because mm -hmm. they're different sets of muscles so it shouldn't have felt like more of the same exercises yeah inhales governed by your diaphragm Exhale is all your core muscles and your internal intracostals. And this is actually really cool because yesterday you were mentioning to us, I don't know, it's, uh, you mentioned after the age of 29, the ability for people to, I don't know, increase their ability to breathe better starts to decrease after the age of 29, mm -hmm. right? But with exercises, something like this, or, or just paying attention to improving that over time, just like sarcopenia with weight training and resistance training, you don't have to lose muscle every single year. This could be something that allows people to increase their ability and their lung capacity as they get older. And think about that for an athlete or for someone in a career where breathing is important. Mm -hmm. So for longevity of career and longevity of, of your sport is that you need to integrate breathing muscle training into what you do, not only because 
we are in a respiratory health crisis and there's more viruses coming down the pipe, yeah. but because you want to continue to be a firefighter, you want to continue to be able to do jujitsu or run or lift or whatever at a certain level. So if you already know at age 29, my pulmonary function is going to plateau, you got to do something about that mm -hmm. because every year your lung capacity is going to go down. And it doesn't need to. I mean, yes, we age yeah. and some things you can't control, but look at these exercises. You can do these exercises. You, I'll, I love that gadget. You don't need it, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't need any. I don't think you need any gadget. Yeah. Uh, personally. But so you can do breathing exercises of all sorts. It's right under your nose. <laughs> Yeah. Do you have any tips for uh, like clearing out your throat or clearing out your, your lungs? Because uh, after I had COVID, mm -hmm. I, it was followed up by weeks of like just trying to cough up phlegm that just either wasn't there or it was like super, super sticky. And I just I couldn't clear my throat. So like I'm on the podcast and I'm like back here coughing and I'm sure it got super annoying. So I apologize to everybody. But like I just could not clear my throat. So you have any tips on how to clear your throat? Okay, so what you want is called a productive cough. And it's so funny because like it sounds like oh, a productive cough. It actually means like <laughs> stuff comes up, kind of gross, okay? Mm, nice. But what I want you to do is think about the difference between a cough that's a vertical cough and a cough that's a horizontal cough, right? A horizontal cough is going to be a lot more efficient and it's going to actually get stuff out of your body. So you have to focus on Big inhale, because it's going to help the exhale be better, and then you force yourself to cough horizontally, and you'll feel more stuff coming up. Mm. So again, that whole idea of a productive cough, yeah. um, super important. What are you giggling I about? Just, yeah. I just, I, I just kind of like, you were, we were both kind of, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you can kind of feel <laughs> yeah. that. So it yeah. makes, you're going to launch it sense. forward. Yeah. 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 Everybody watch out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm right in your line I know, fire, right? <laughs> no, I'm all good now. But yeah, it was weeks and I could not get rid of it. It fucking yeah. sucked. Yeah. So part of it is deconditioning. Um, another part, and again, we're doing the research on this right now, is that um, there is, uh, what happens is that the oxygen going into into your body, there's a problem with that. So you, I, I want you to think about like scar tissue is mm. that it's harder for oxygen to cross that barrier. So we're learning about what you could do with that and they're learning to see how they can get that to um, kind of get thinner so that the oxygen can go through. But for me, if you have a vertical breather that's not using all their lungs and their lung capacity is mediocre, yeah. why don't we actually get their lung capacity to be better and we'll actually have access to healthy part of lung tissue? Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about this because like I, I got your book, right? Breathing for Warriors. It was really, really good. Um, so I think everybody should just grab it. But what are some other books, authors, Ooh. in terms of the breathing space? Because, you know, we've had a lot of people in the movement space on the yeah. podcast, and that's interesting. But now I think we're getting into this kind of space, too. So what other books oh, I love do you think you are really that. beneficial and maybe people that we should sure, pay sure. attention to? I mean, I'm known for, and my students, you know, sort of grumble sometimes because I recommend a lot of books and I recommend a lot of articles. Mm -hmm. There's fantastic people out there that you might not know that have dedicated their lives to um, this space. Um, so um, as far as books, I mentioned the one by Blandine Kellis. Um, I mentioned uh, Dr. Stephen Michaels, Breathtaking as well. Mm -hmm. um, I love Dan Brulé's book. You probably have that one already. Yeah. Um, Donna Farhi has a great book. It doesn't have a great cover. Ignore the cover. But she <laughs> actually, those, those illustrations and, and the way she explained things are really good. Let Every Breath doesn't teach you about breathing, but the concepts of, of relaxation um, and of what's called locomotive pairing is, is really good in that book. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, there's a book that just came out by some folks, uh, The Bradcliffe Method, which also looks at mechanics. And again, it has one of those breathing books always have such boring titles. I think it's just called The Breathing Book or mm -hmm. How to Breathe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, How to Breathe, I think, is the right way. Um that one I love. Um, Breathe Better, Perform Better is is great. Uh, Allison McConnell. Um, it's a tough read, but uh, it's a good book. Um, if you really want to go deep, Leon Chaitao uh, has a great book. And 
that's what I've got at the top of my head. And obviously Nestor's book mm -hmm. is great. Like any of the popular books that are out there as far as breathing, like, you know, more information is better and different styles of writing and different opinions. Got Good it. stuff. Um, as far as researchers and other folks, um, hmm, there's a Italian um, anatomist, if that's the word, uh, Bruno Bordoni. Okay. Um, who wrote a great article about the diaphragm and also somebody named Skip George. He's out of California here as well, who wrote a great article about the diaphragm. Um, the psoas muscle, my favorite article about that is Tom Myers, who mm, you know, is a I movement person, okay. and he, he calls it the cobra muscle. So that's a great one. And, you know, I'll be happy to, that should keep you busy for, mm -hmm. for a little while. <laughs> that will, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Please drop us some comments and hit that like button on your on your way out. And uh, subscribe if you guys are not subscribed already. And please follow the podcast uh, at MB Power Project on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z. And Simo, where are you at? Uh, guys, again, check out this book because, again, you, you reference a lot of diff – especially on the lifting section. You've referenced Jesse oh, yeah. Burdick and a lot of other lifters too. It's a really good applicable book for different types of athletes in different sport and how they should breathe. So fucking get that book. Um, <laughs> at Nsima Inyang on Instagram and YouTube. At Nsima Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Dr. Lisa, where can people find you? Uh, d uh Instagram is Dr. Belisa, the breathing class, breathing for warriors. I think that's the three of them. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.